Hey, everybody. Welcome to the October 18th Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners meeting. We're going to get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I uh, call on Bryce for a roll call, I want to point out that we're not joined by Brian as we usually are. We are joined by Justin to help with the cameras. I don't know, Justin, can you put a camera on yourself? Justin cannot. <laughs> Justin can. Okay. Well, well, we are grateful for you being here and big fan of the name. It's a strong name. It's a good name. Bryce, go ahead and roll call. Commissioner Beaman. Present. Commissioner Hodge. Present. Commissioner Labar. Here. Commissioner Light. Present. Commissioner Machieski. Present. Commissioner Robbie. Present. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Scott. Commissioner Somerville. Present. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. So we have the team here that we have. I would point out that Commissioner Scott is not with us here today, but she is watching live. She may give public comment. Uh, we wish her well. Before I get into public participation, uh, and I know that there is significant public participation tonight, we look forward to hearing all of it, as well as uh, you know we have received written public participation as well. And I think there's even people out in the hall. Uh, I'm gonna, as I do from time to time, take things out of order. We have uh, a resolution to honor a community member. I will read the resolution first, and then we will move into public participation. So bear with me as I hobble over to the podium in the boot. So we have a resolution here to honor the life of Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. was a dedicated and inspirational spiritual leader who devoted his life to serving the Lord and uplifting his community. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. embarked on a spiritual mission to fulfill God's calling on his life, founding Christian Faith Church with his beloved wife, Pastor, Pastor Linda Johnson, and purchasing over 11 acres of land at 2885 Ellis Road in Ypsilanti, historically known for its racist and inhumane treatment of African-Americans, transforming it into a place of wor worship that leads people to everlasting life. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. faced numerous legal obstacles, community hurdles, and financial hardships in building the Christian faith church, but his unwavering faith and determination allowed God's will to prevail, creating a place of love, faith, and fellowship. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. served the community both in the church and beyond, holding a career at General Motors for 36 years as a licensed journeyman, machine repairman, retiring in 2006 and receiving numerous awards and acknowledgements for his outstanding service in the community and the state of Michigan. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. was consecrated as a bishop in 2003 and achieved various certificates of merit in theology and preaching. And whereas Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. had a profound vision for Christian faith and church, aiming to manifest God's glory and promote the greater work of evangelism in the life and lives of mankind for Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, be resolved, the Washington County Board of Commissioners honors the life of Bishop Roger Johnson Sr. and recognizes his tireless dedication to the community, his family, and we are grateful for the light he's shown on our community. So I want to give the family an opportunity to say a few words. Like, Thank you so much, all of you. Um, my husband, along with me, we serviced the community for about 36 years jail ministry, prison street ministry, um, which was really a blessing for us to serve mankind. And that's part of my heart to help those that uh, need help. And I thank all of you so much for the resolution and your signing. And may you have a good evening on purpose. Thank you very much, um, Pastor Roger Johnson Jr. Um, I am very grateful to receive this uh, on behalf of my myself, my mother, my family, and the entire Christian Faith Church family as well. We uh, really appreciate you, and uh, God bless.
Good evening, commissioners. God bless and uh, wonderful administrator. <laughs> Good to see you too, corporate council, and all of you who have been a part of this county that are here tonight. I just wanted to let you know that Mr. Roger Johnson was no ordinary man. Uh, Mr. Roger Johnson was a neighbor of mine, and my daughters played with his daughters. And he was a man who had a purpose. Uh, his life changed one day uh, during a tragic uh, accident in his own yard where his son was run over by a car. Changed his life. His son lived, as you can see, he is now the standing pastor of Christian Faith Church. But I just wanted you to know that he built a library on the second floor of his home to build knowledge inside of himself so that he to bring life and understanding to those who were lost and downtrodden, and bring those who could bring bring to, bring them to the full potential and wholeness that their lives were meant to be. And after that, he built a church. And when I say he built a library on the second floor and built a church, he did it with his own hands. Had very little help. That church now stands there for the last few years, and is one of the pillars of the community in which it is in off of Ellis Road near Michigan Avenue, which was a place where we had a lot of uh, racial encounters that were not, uh, uh, let's say, favorable for some people. And for that church to sit there now and draw lives, to change lives, to become community, uh, social, and people who give their lives to sacrifice their lives to help others is a testimony and that is what I'm grateful for you guys recognizing that your chairman writing and allowing me to give them this resolution because this family is going to need a lot of help in the, in the days to come and I just wanted to let you know that he is an honorable man and like your chairman said to me he deserves to be recognized so thank you thank you so on behalf of Washington County, we thank the Bishop and his family for many, many years of service uh, and all the work that they've done for the community. All right, well, we are back to our regularly scheduled programming here. So here at the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners meeting, you get three minutes for public comment. You will approach the podium. I will call on you. Uh, and then we have a nice color-coded system right there at the podium. It starts at green, goes down to yellow. When you have one minute left and then at red, you got to stop. You got to stop at the three minutes. Otherwise, I have to cut you off, and I don't want to have to do that. So when you start giving public comment, please state your name and the city or township that you live in uh, in Washtenaw County. Uh, take the three minutes and then you'll move on and we'll go to the next person. If you're joining us via Zoom, you'll get your chance to participate as well. You'll hit star nine to raise your hand. Uh, I will call on you. You will hit the star six button. Uh, okay, this is all over the place. That's if you join us on Zoom by phone. Star nine and then star six to unmute, state your name, same rules apply. If you're just on Zoom via the Zoom client, it's easy enough. You just hit the raise your hand icon, call on you. That didn't go so well. All right. Well, uh, who would like to give public comment? Well, just come on down. You know, you can form a line if you'd like. I know there are many people in the hall too. Uh, whatever works. All right. Go ahead. State your name, where you live. Hi. Um, my name is Tess Rouster. I live in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, and I'm here on behalf of a grassroots group of organizations addressing homelessness in the county. Um, 
so uh, as you all know, we are experiencing an affordable housing crisis, um, which is resulting in the current homelessness crisis. I know you all have been talking about it for a minute now. Um, Washtenaw County has the third most economic inequality in Michigan. And as a result, Ypsilanti is getting hit harder than other areas by this housing crisis in many ways. Um, our housing prices have quadrupled since 2013 and rent has increased 13% from 21, 2021 to 2022. Um, yet though we often have a greater need, Ipsy is typically underserved. Um, this past summer, we had a bunch of folks sleeping outside, growing hope. It was about 15 to 20 adults um, throughout the summer. Um, and it's just not acceptable that in a county um, with so many resources, people are forced into that situation, um, which is a situation people are experiencing all across the county in unprecedented numbers currently. Um, I support housing as the number one solution to homelessness, um, as I know many of you do. And we need long-term solutions to homelessness in this county, but we don't have them right now. And the people that we have failed um, are suffering the consequences of it. Um, moreover, this economy is set against pe people. It is set up to force people into homelessness. And so we need emergency shelter options. Uh, right now, it is getting cold outside. Um, and the numbers of people who are experiencing homelessness are, have been skyrocketing throughout the summer and as we've been getting into these colder months. Um, so in Ypsilanti, we need somewhere for men and women to stay any day and any night of the week like there is in Ann Arbor this winter. Um, so to everyone who's behind me, um, if you want the county to support robust funding solutions for emergency shelter seven nights per week, in both Ipsy and Ann Arbor this winter, please stand up. Or raise your hand. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the first person always reminds me that we can't respond immediately, all right? So I, I appreciate the statement. And then once everybody is done, please stick around because that's when commissioners will be able to respond. It's not that we don't wanna respond immediately, but it's just the, the way the agenda works. Come on down. I just wanted to start off with some thank yous. Uh, compared to other counties, Washtenaw is often uh, earlier and more generous on uh, ways to take care of folks that are especially poor and needy. And you guys have in many departments been um, a leader to uh, Southeast Michigan and ways to do that. I'm grateful for the things that you guys have already done. I'm here today, of course, uh, as you might imagine, because uh, the need it outstrips uh, what has so far been provided. Um, having talked with uh, folks who uh, keep track of the census of the people who are attempting to get into the shelter, uh, there is a 101st 40, 140 person long, uh, treat, what they call triage or waiting list to get into the shelter. Um, I had this made real to me earlier this week uh, with a young woman uh, who has uh, two twins and is currently living under an overhang, sorry, two twins in her stomach, um, several months pregnant, currently living in an overhang. Uh, some folks feel that it's only appropriate to house folks once they have a child, but I think that while you're pregnant is a very dangerous time to be unhoused, and she is one of those 140 people who's unhoused. Currently, there's a disparity in the amount of services pro uh, provided between Washtenaw County's two sister cities where the majority of the population lives in both Ipsy and Ann Arbor. In Ypsilanti, there is a uh, rotating shelter that's supposed to move to faith community to faith community uh, like it does in Ann Arbor. And that uh, rotating shelter does not rotate because there's only one faith community that has signed up in Ypsilanti. There has been an ask made of a multitude of faith communities in Ypsilanti to participate with the shelter in accomplishing the rotating shelter there. So this is an ask to everyone who has friends in a faith community of any kind or knows of buildings that are open to consider reaching out to the shelter to make that happen. I'm grateful to uh, Dan Kelly for committing to raise on top of 2.3 million, which runs the shelter this year, another $200,000 to uh, fund uh, the day shelter and the nighttime. 
And I'm grateful to Amanda Carlisle for making the case for $300,000 of additional funding to cover uh, diversions of families and individuals who might become homeless. And I appreciate your time today. I need your name and where you live. A most commanding voice, you will get that answer. I am Caleb Boyer and I live at 805 West Huron Street, Mercy House, where we take care of the homeless, just kitty corner from the shelter. Thank you. Please state your name and where you live. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Barbara Fuller. I live at 17750 Sharon Valley Road in Sharon Township, which is uh, near the village of Manchester. Um, I'm here tonight to draw your, as the chair of the Washtenaw County Road Commission, to draw your attention to page 41 of your packet, where the Road Commission's resolution is included in your materials, asking you to put the renewal and restoration of the four-year half mill road levy before the voters of Washtenaw County in the 2024 state and local primary election, which as you know, at this point may either be in June or in August. Um, I'm one of those people that likes to plan ahead, a, a belt and suspenders kind of person. Um, so I'm considering that we're gonna be faced with a June primary and we'll be looking at planning uh, for that eventuality. It's also worth noting, although it was not in your packet, that the Washtenaw County Parks, Parks and Recreation Commission at their mission on meeting on October 10th, passed a similar resolution asking the Board of County Commissioners to place this renew and restore roads and non-motorized millage on the ballot. Um, I'd like to ask that you look at page six of the white paper, which I believe, I'm not sure which page that appears on now. Page 137 and forward. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out to you on page six, it indicates that there is a $89,174 and change fund balance at the Road Commission that reflects millage dollars. I want to be clear that those dollars are fully obligated. We are not sitting on $89,000 that we don't know what to do with. It's already been programmed. Uh, what happens is the work is completed and we invoice the county to be reimbursed out of the existing millage. The voters have been very supportive of this millage a couple of times over, approving it by more than 70%. And I firmly believe the reason, couple of reasons why they do that. One, the roads are in deplorable condition, particularly in the rural parts of the county. But more importantly, this millage is structured in such a way that every penny that's raised in a township or an Act 51 agency goes back directly to them. The programming is done in collaboration with the partners in those various jurisdictions so that they know exactly what the money will be spent on. They have input on that. And we work very hard to educate them on that and have it be successful. So I would respectfully ask you to once again, place that millage sooner, hopefully yet this calendar year to the ballot for next year's primary election so that we can continue to do the good work that the Road Commission has done with those dollars in partnership with the Act 51 agencies and townships in the county. Perfectly timed. Uh, now for our friends that use board portal, you don't have to go by page number anymore. You can just go right into the communications tab and then there it is. Wow, wow. And you also don't have to give your full address. You just have to say the city or township. You're welcome to do that and Bryce will take it, but name and where you live. My name is Anna Wysocki. I no longer live in Washtenaw County, but I am a council member of Journey of Faith, previously named Memorial Christian Church, which is located in District 8. I'm speaking on behalf of my church community, which is a service community, and on behalf of everyone here who believes that housing is a human right. I want to request funding for more temporary housing options, specifically more temporary shelter options in Ypsilanti. Uh, the model of hospitality that my fellow service providers and I are most supportive, supportive of is the model where options are dispersed throughout an area at various host sites and would be available as soon as possible as the crisis exists now. We understand that emergency shelter doesn't solve the problem of homelessness, but it does affect the issue of the crisis one experiences without shelter. Um, 
For example, uh, we celebrate the Daytime Warming Center for its efficacy and for its partnership with the community. However, we want to urge for more shelter to be available seven days and nights per week, which is currently not the case for some folks and especially in Ypsilanti. I myself have experienced significant housing insecurity. This was true when I did live in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. I have friends and family members who experienced it now in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor, some who are here in this room, some who are not. So in requesting a funding approval, I do speak for myself, but as a council member of Journey of Faith, I speak on behalf of my church community and my service community and those who I know who are experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Noah Dollar and I live in Northfield Township. Uh, in light of the report that we just saw during the working session um, that highlighted the need for additional overnight uh, warming shelter space, uh, I thought I would give a few updates on that 10 South Prospect building that I brought up in the past um, as a, a fairly you know, efficient and inexpensive option for adding some of that overnight shelter space. Uh, one update is that um, I looked into the zoning and zone general corridor. And so it looks like one of the options um, specifically that would be allowed is, it, is a homeless shelter um, specifically. Uh, I met with an agent, I checked out the inside. Uh, it seems to be in great shape um, structurally. The electrical and plumbing seems good. Uh, I'm not an inspector, but um, it seems like probably the biggest changes would just be drywall and flooring. So probably the next step for that location would be to get an inspector, take a look at it and see how much renovations would cost. Um, again, it's a very inexpensive option. It's only $300,000. Renovations I don't think would be that much. And then it's just a matter of staffing it, which I know can be more expensive. Thank you. Thank you. Your Hodge, commissioners. Administrator Dill, my name is Zach Fossler. I live in Pittsfield Township. I am here as the Executive Director of the Ypsilanti Housing Commission. Um, first off, I want to state that I stand in solidarity with my colleagues here who work in the homelessness system, who, who are experiencing homelessness, and I agree that we do need additional funding for uh, homelessness services within Ypsilanti, absolutely. Um, I come here for another reason tonight, though, as well. Um, one was to uh, listen to the administration strategy proposal for housing and homelessness. It's supposed to be later in the, the evening here, uh, which I probably will watch from Zoom. Um, but I wanted to share a little information about the Ypsilanti Housing Commission um, that I'm not sure everyone is aware of. Um, so one, um, I think we all have an interest in increasing the availability of housing on the east side of the county. Um, I urge the county to engage um, the Ypsilanti Housing Commission in any discussions that involve new development um, prior to creating a county housing commission. Um, we have two housing commissions um, already within the within Washtenaw County, um, Ypsilanti Housing Commission and Arbor, and Arbor Housing Commission. Um, and both of us are available and are willing to develop um, anywhere in the county um, and anywhere in any county, frankly. Um, the YHC currently owns and manages 342 units of housing um, and has been the general partner in four different low-income housing tax credit deals, um, the last three of which were under my uh, purview in the last 10 years that I've been at the YHC. Uh, we partner and hire a co-developer uh, for more complex projects with complex capital stacks, but that doesn't mean that we're afraid of them or not willing to take them on. Um, we can develop rental occupied, owner occupied, low income, mixed income, et cetera. Um, so if the county wants to add more and new resources uh, for the development, um, it's wonderful and absolutely welcome. Um, but it's more efficient to provide gap financing uh, to an existing developer that you know is already in the community and is already doing this work, um, isn't going anywhere. We were created in 1950s and we're still here and doing the work. Um, then it's easier to, to provide that gap financing than it is to try and create something new and do it over again and, uh, and really creating a new organization from scratch. Uh, and so really, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. And I really look forward to discussing this further. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Colin Spry. I stayed in uh, downtown Ann Arbor and uh, I just came here to speak from the heart. Um, I. A little about myself is uh, I've been homeless since 2019 when my wife died in a car accident and uh, she was the last family that I had. And without her, I've had nobody. I've been living on the street of, of Ann Arbor basically because Ann Arbor is a special community. I've been all over the country via uh, freight trains and I've seen all different walks of life. And this place is an anomaly. There is uh, what I would call an actual homeless community. There are people here that actually take care of each other. We're like family. 
And then there is a community that takes care of our community. People like Peggy, Gracie, uh, Cynthia, they, they look out for us in ways that uh, nobody else around the country I've ever seen do. Um, this summer, unfortunately, has been a rough summer though. Uh, the, the, there's been a lot of bigotry. We've been pushed around, bullied, thrown out of uh, every different place. We were at the plaza. The police came in the middle of the night, threw us out, threw all our stuff in the trash, uh, kicked some kid in the head. Uh, and then we all moved down under the bridge, under Fuller Bridge, because we had no other options, where uh, the bulldozers came and tried to bulldoze all of our stuff. And we stood there, and we would not let them touch our things because that's all that we have. And so really, it's been an unfortunate event to see this bigotry aimed at people who have nothing. I really, uh, it continues to blow my mind. But I still support this community. I think it's a very beautiful place, very special. So really all I wanted to say today was just the decisions that are made today, just know that as hard as this summer has been, the winter is gonna be even harder and lives are really at stake here. So all lives matter. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Colin has a tough act to follow. I'm Cynthia Price, I live in Ann Arbor. Um, I actually, um, you know, attended the, the work session. Um, I had seen that presentation earlier this afternoon. Um, I, I uh, want to comment that I hope that you'll be supportive of the, the um, winter um, housing task force came up with. Um, and I know that their, their final recommendations are, are yet to come. Um, but I also um, looked through the administrator's um, um, report that I, I Thank you, by the way, for moving it up. Um, but the the um, I it, it the part the way that I saw it in the board packet thingy, um, it didn't look very um, specific. Um, but I did want to say that uh, um, I didn't see anything about eviction diversion funds, which I, I think is very important. And I also um, did want to applaud the fact that it, they're asking for more case management. Because again, I think that case management is kind of a um, is kind of a diversion, a shelter diversion. Because if people are getting assistance, getting their driver's license, they get jobs. Um, you know, they can they can uh, uh, make their way without having to um, you know be forced to in, in endure indignities of the nature that that uh, Colin was talking about. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Ann Rout, and I'm the executive director of the Michigan Advocacy Program. We're the parent organization of legal services of South Central Michigan. Um, our office is at 15 South Washington in Ypsilanti, and I also live in the city of Ypsilanti. Um, I'm very excited and grateful to be, see that uh, our recommendation, our grant proposal for the high impact grant is on the, the agenda tonight. Um, the Michigan Advocacy Program has been serving low-income and marginalized communities, members of our community here for over 50 years. Um, I can tell you in 2022, we closed over 2,000 cases for folks in this county. And that meant though, that there were still many other cases that were open and we still have a huge unmet need in this county for our services. I can also assure you that those services were provided in every county, in every corner of this county and across many substantive areas. Because we do hear a lot about homelessness and it is a huge need in this county. But we also know that underlying that are issues of barriers to employment, domestic violence, folks getting caught up in consumer scams, elder abuse, and we represent people across all of those areas. So while the unmet needs are great and highly critical and the pandemic has increased the need for our services, our funding is actually going down. Um, a lot of the COVID related funding has already ended and our eviction diversion funding is slated to end at the, at the end of 2024. So I can assure you that the process leading to the high impact grants application process was extensive. Uh, there were many planning meetings where we were able to get information of you know, finding out what you all were looking for. We think it's really honorable and we're so excited because 
MAP says that one of our values is that there should be a fair and equitable treatment for all under our legal system. And that matches right on with what your goals were under this grant proposal. Um, it was an extensive process. We provided lots of information. I, I think it was one of the largest grant applications we ever did. It was a book about the history of our work in this community. So we're really excited. We would like to get it going. We've been waiting close to a year now. The need is there. Our staff is ready. I don't wanna lose staff. And there's a hole in our budget. I'm watching the federal budget we, and nervously. We really need this money. And I'm hoping that you can move the resolution forward tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Tish Lee. Um, I live in Northville, Michigan, but I have been serving the citizens of Washtenaw County for over 25 years as an attorney with Legal Services of South Central Michigan. I'm now the managing attorney of that office. So Anne is my boss. Um, I'm not here because she told me to be here. I'm here because I also believe in our mission passionately. And I'm here in support of the resolution approving the final recommendations for the Human Services Partnership High Impact Grant. We work very hard on this grant as Anne has mentioned. Um, and uh, we have an amazing uh, plan for in, in our proposal. And I do wanna say too that I lead an amazing team of legal professionals who are absolutely passionate about equity and access to justice, and they are ready to do what's needed. And this funding is going to help them achieve what we need to achieve. Um, we're hoping to address not only housing and homelessness, which we've always done through our eviction prevention efforts and other foreclosure prevention and other housing related work that we do. But as Anne said, there are a host of other issues that also impact um, uh, housing and homelessness and uh, affect people and uh, lead to them being unhoused, consumer issues and um, probate issues, um, income and benefits issues, domestic violence. Those are all issues that we have much expertise in, much experience in, and we're ready to move forward. Um, and the unique thing about the plan that we've proposed in our grant is that we are, instead of sitting in our office in Ypsilanti and waiting for people to come to us, we are gonna go out into communities and talk to folks, get deeply embedded and find out what the needs of community people are. We wanna listen very deeply to what their concerns are and uh, address those collaboratively with them and other stakeholders in the community. Um, we're very excited also about the opportunity to work with the evaluation team that's proposed because we wanna be very deliberate about how we plan this process. Um, and we'd also like to invite any of you who are interested to come to our office. And we are right on South Washington Street across from the Growing Hope facility. And we're already amidst the folks who need us most, but we want to reach deeper. And so if any of you um, would like to visit our office, we would love to host you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on down. Hello, my name is Magnus the Entertainer and um, thank y'all for being here today. I represent the part of the community that there's a few questions, right? So I have these questions, these are like general questions. So what happens when you close your door at the end of your night, okay? And where must the homeless and unhoused lay down to be charged for the next productive day, okay? These are questions, right? So as someone who shares his experience with this community, um, I like to look at us as community members, regardless of our situation. Um, what do we think will help? These are some of the questions that I ask myself while going through uh, these changes as a um, professional and stuff like that, right? Well, not one individual program can solve these issues, right? Not one program. It has to be all of us together, all the programs, right? Number one, funding the rotation shelter, okay? 
in 2020, I was in the rotation shelter myself, and um, I was also in the Delanis shelter too at the same time. Um, as someone who's building a career while in this position, um, there's a lot of things that could have happened um, that would probably stop the person. But because of the rotation shelter and the Delanis Center working together, um, a lot was achieved um, on their part and the community that they serve. Another thing, keeping people alive. Right, so it's not just about getting a person a place to live. It's not just about giving a person something to get through the day. It's about actually keeping people alive because that's what these services are doing, ultimately. Um, breaking into new permanent housing solutions. So a lot of times we think of situations like this that has many different layers to it because it does. So we must be creative, okay? Permanent solutions for the veterans, the disabled, and the elderly, okay? I see a lot of people who served our country. I see a lot of people who worked 20, 30 years. I see a lot of individuals who earned a place to comfortably be. Not saying that folks haven't, but these individuals has probably earned. And we forget about them sometimes because we run out of money. Getting the able back to work. So, it's individuals out here that possess professional skills that have degrees and that have um, technical training and vocational training that uh, we can help get back to work. Um, my experience in the Delana Center and the rotating shelter, as I said before, um, I've seen it help others and it helped myself too along the way. Um, properly matching individuals with homes that accommodate their needs like the elderly, the disabled and the veterans. I myself is legally blind and I operate this way every day. Okay, there's no excuse, right? But it will be nice to have services that are there, right? So your time is up, uh, but can you state your name? Or you state your name where you yes. live or a, a location? Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, Michigan. thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah. Name and where you live. My name is James William Milstead, a.k.a. Rainbow Country Love, and I live in Ann Arbor. I'm currently a 23-year-old homeless veteran of Ann Arbor. I've been housed for, for six months by, by Avalon Housing for them to hold my apartment while I was incarcerated for a year to take and sit there and what, have me sign a piece of paper to exit with the clothing on my back to be homeless once again. I got rheumatoid arthritis. I'm going to tell you, our system's been broke. It's been broke for a while. And you know what? You're not going to fix it when you're not, not taking a look at the fact that most of the, most of the people that are homeless within our community either have mental health, drug out, or alcohol issues. If we don't deal with these drug and alcohol issues and mental health issues, we're not going to fix our community. Okay? We're just going to be lying to ourselves. We have at current, current, we have a shelter. We call it the Delanas. Well, I'm going to tell you the Delanas is more, basically more so a parole release center and a drug den. Okay. It's also used at times for human trafficking. We need to fix that issue. Okay. And that's coming from somebody that is almost in your community and is currently taking the same bill on probation and doing five years of probation and has a lifetime registry for trying to take drugs off of your streets. Being crack cocaine, methamphetamines and fentanyl. Now, do I think that we need another shelter? Yeah, we definitely need a 24 hour shelter. We need a safe place for mamas and babies. We need safe places for children to, to take and sit there and go with. Not just mine, but the rest of this community's children. We don't have that. We don't have a safe place that I would take and sit there and recommend a young lady to go to. There ain't one, not in this community. If you're homeless living on the street and you're living in a tent, well, hopefully one of the local officers don't take and see your tent because what are they going to do? They're going to tell you, you've got 48 hours and we're throwing your stuff away. And by the way, it's a $500 fine if you're caught there. Do you think your homeless individual can pay $500? It's 
So we're tiring up more and costing more city more money. Why don't we take and sit there and fix what's broken and not try to create something new? Because we don't need to create something new. We don't need to fix what we got. And in order to fix what we got, we might they can have to have some structure. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of that. And I'm surely not taking um, half of with Hawk that has a monopoly on our housing that's preventing these agencies from doing their job. Thank you. Name and city or township. Uh, my name's Luna. I live in Ann Arbor. I'm also a part of a grassroots coalition addressing homelessness in Ypsilanti. Uh, to start my comments, I want to say that I am disturbed and disappointed by your decision two meetings ago to give an additional $500,000 to the Sheriff's Office for Community Corrections, a program supported by millage funds when they are sitting in an excess budget of $6 million in millage funds. Thank you to Commissioner Robbie for being the only person to vote no. This is obscene decision making. How can such a decision be justified when hundreds of our neighbors are unhoused? I ask you not to give any further funds to the sheriff's office and to retract that special permission to hold funds rather than return them to the general fund. Those are not the sheriff's office dollars. They are the taxpayers dollars. And I would like to see those dollars going to mental health, public health and housing programs not facilitated by law enforcement. To that end, I want to remind you that the county's body, OCED, is the continuum of care lead for the county. That means you are ultimately responsible for and accountable for housing and homelessness in the county. While we want all everyone in the county to contribute to helping our neighbors, and we go to every municipality to ask for that, we expect you to ensure that it happens. I reiterate what the community has been and will continue to ask for. 24 seven temporary shelter for the winter and a pathway to permanent housing for all people. The Shelter Association of Washtenaw County is asking for at least $200,000 for overnight rotating shelter. We should fund that. It's less than half of what you just gave to the Sheriff's Office. Fund the Shelter Task Force most robust plan for winter shelter, including eviction prevention and diversion efforts and fund housing first solutions that will end house homelessness in our county. If you need community support, ask us. We're here and we're clearly organized. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. Hello, my name is John Curtis Stahl and I live in a homeless camp in Washtenaw County. Um, I just want to start off by saying, uh, truly grateful for the, the lot setter. There's been plenty of times that I would have froze to them if it wasn't bad for them and for them beat this. And um, I also want to say that I'm grateful for the Sheriff's Department because there's a certain sheriff that I'm not going to mention no names that does welfare checks on our camp and personally make sure that we're okay. And the, um, although they, he gets on us and about drinking or whatever once in a while, but um, he still cares. And he doesn't, he doesn't want to arrest us. He, he doesn't, he doesn't want to take us to jail or anything. He just wants to make sure that he's okay. And I hope that the city and the county will continue to fund the Robert J. Dillon Center because somebody like me truly depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Name and city or township. Hey everyone. My name is Brian Geringer. Uh, I live in the gerrymandered port of 
Ward 1, Ypsilanti. I'm also the chair of the Ypsilanti Board of Ethics. Uh, I want to start by applauding Commissioner Robbie on his bravery and bringing some truth and sanity into the conversation on September 20th. Um, I also want to say shame on the rest of you. Uh, that decision is going to come back to haunt you. Uh, not only did you not demand that the Sheriff's Office return the $6 million that it is hoarding to the county, so that as Commissioner Robbie pointed out, the board can control the purse of the county, uh, which is quite literally your job. Not only did not a single, not a single one of you defend your colleague, but you voted to send the sheriff an additional, an additional half million dollars. That is ludicrous. Now this conversation is about what makes us safe. Uh, Hyperinflated police budgets do not make us safe. Uh, the largest weapon in the world is the U.S. jail and prison system, and yet there's still too many so-called criminals for the jails to handle in this county. That is madness. The humane thing is not a sophisticated and extensive tether system. It is rethinking and reimagining how safety comes about in this county. One way to make safety occur out of nowhere is providing places to shelter our unhoused and housing insecure neighbors. So you all better build a shelter in Ipsy by spring, and you better figure out a temporary solution by winter and ensure that the people themselves have control over it. Those are our demands. Uh, you gave $500,000 to the sheriff in what was basically a municipal like, like hostage situation. Uh, you better be spending more than that on something that will actually have an impact on the safety of the community. And while we're at it, we could cut every police department budget in the county in half overnight if we simply stop letting the cops chase around black and poor and unhoused people all day and all night long. Um, in part, I'm talking about pretext stops. And that term might sound familiar if any of you were in the county when Ellie Savitt ran for prosecutor because he and Sheriff Clayton were on WXYZ talking about how it's a harm to the community for cops to be pulling over people for minor offenses that have nothing to do with community safety. And the reality is, one, this practice is the root cause of an incredible amount of racial disparity in policing in this country and county. And two, Reuters just released an article uh, discussing how quite literally police departments spend something like half of all their money doing these racially disparate pretext stops. Um, People, I, including myself, have been writing and talking about this extensively on What's Left Ipsy. Uh, you can look at Facebook or IG or our, our uh, website. Lastly, I just do want to say history is watching us right now. Uh, free Palestine. Thank you. My name is Adam Keith. I'm one of the Adam Robert homeless. Um, I was recently uh, released from prison a little over four months ago. Um, and I want to go and talk about what people have talked about. You know, you, we find a place to sleep and you don't want to see us on State Street or Main Street and the police come and throw us out. Or the fact that this, this, this county waste, uh, shut down a whole school system will run to fund that county jail. And, you know, and I, I, you know, so I've been in that county jail more times than I can remember. If you put a gun to my head and said, how many times I tell you to pull the trigger. But, you know, and I want to thank every person that stepped before me and except for the one woman who cried about her bumpy road. You know, we're talking about human lives here. And, you know, you waste money on, you know, fixing Main Street, fixing State Street, having smart fairs, having street fairs, when you've got a thousand people who are facing freezing this winter. You know, I know people, including myself, that are actual geniuses out there, you know, but we lost our medals. I lost my medal. I faced things that would make every one of you want to die, you know, and homelessness is not even one of my concerns, but you, you, what, you waste all this money. and when you know, you got churches who don't want to help us. You know, you want to spend this on a pop and circumstance. You know, when we, we got people who are literally freezing, starving. You know, I go to that shelter and get it's discriminated against every day because I'm a sex offender. But I walk in there every day. And I love this woman right here. I love this woman because she, she has a shit job. I'm sorry for swearing that she doesn't get paid anything. And she goes there because she wants to help us, you know. And, and there's times where they want to throw me out because 
yeah, I'll get loud. I, peacocks are not, they were not modest birds. <laughs> you know, and this is the only way I stay sane. I can't, I literally had over the weekend, had to check myself into the psych hospital because I've been screaming for help my whole life and they won't listen to me. No one listens to hopes. They definitely don't listen to a 13 time felon. They definitely don't listen to a sex offender. But I'm in tears up here for what you, what you people want to spend your money on. You know, you would rather see us drop dead. I, I, I know this, not maybe not all of you, but that's how I feel. And I wanted to spend my last minute, but I, I'm almost in tears here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, humans. My name is Jessica Lee O'Connor. I live in beautiful Ann Arbor. I love it. And we need your help. I work at Delanis. I'm not speaking for Delanis. I'm speaking as a human that has struggled with homelessness myself over 20 years ago. And I'm here to say we need you. These are your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your weird neighbor. This is the, these are people you know. These are broken humans and we are busting at the seams. And I'm here to say, help us, please. Come to Delanis, donate your time. Go to Peggy's, donate food. She cooks a kick ass breakfast Saturday morning that feeds us, come on. We need your help. This is Ann Arbor or Washtenaw County. And it's just, I have, my life has purpose working for Delanis. I worked at an awesome orthodontic office, 16 years. I come to Delanis a year ago. I don't want to leave. I'll work on my day off. I'll drive the van. It's a great place. These people need us. I mean, it's just a human interaction. They're, they're broken and they're hollow and they're vets and they're new mothers. And you give somebody Narcan, that's some hard shit, man. That is life and we're struggling and we need your help. They need somewhere to stay. It's going to be cold soon. And they're camping in the green belt and they camp behind goldfish and they camp where they can and they shouldn't have to, but they do. Peggy's can only do so much. There's other wonderful houses, Sherry's. We just, we need your help. I'm here to say, we need your help. Anything you can donate time, your money is what we need. Um, but your presence is important because we are members of the community. And if we can house them, they'll be really upstanding members of the community because they're going to come back and they're going to give it. I had COVID at Christmas. I worked two days before Christmas. I had COVID. I felt like shit. I'm like in a blanket waiting to go leave. I had people who have nothing bring me soup, oatmeal, water, tea. They have nothing. And they're giving me something. How can I give back? How can I give to people that deserve it? They just had a shit show of a life and here they are. And, and we see them on the street. We can put money in a cup, buy your ground cover people, buy the $15 edition, cause they need it. They work hard, Our transgender. All of them need you. They need us, they need your vote. Give these people money, why? Because we love them, why? Because we're human, why? Cause we're fucking Washington County, that's why. My name is Brian Coburn. I live in the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, I listened to the Winter Task Force say that their most aspirational ask of the commissioners here was uh, $450,000 for uh, eviction defense funds. Uh, I would suggest at $122 a month hike in the fair market value uh, of properties in this county, there is going to be far greater than 150 families that are in danger of being evicted. And for $300,000, uh, the county could purchase 10 South Prospect in the city of Ypsilanti. Uh, as my cohort Noah Dollar said earlier, this is uh, properly zoned uh, and there are dozens of grassroots activists, many of whom are here tonight, who would help facilitate the immediate operations of this building. Uh, finally, the bare minimum the county can do is to expand the Freight House's warming center hours from daytime to 24-7 this winter. It is a Band-Aid, but it is on a wound that is badly bleeding. So finding staff to do this cannot be a low priority. It has to be the top one. Come on down. Hello, y'all. My name is Shehab Jackson. And I'm a resident of uh, Ypsilanti. So I'm gonna keep this brief. Uh, 
I want to just throw my full support behind my previous comrade statements. Um, and I would also just like to put a face to the issues, um, specifically to the appointments of the Washtenaw County Council on Reparations and the Washtenaw County Criminal Justice Collaborative Council. As some of you may have heard, perhaps or perhaps not, um, I have been uh, undergoing some uh, what I feel to be extreme uh, racial inequities right here in the criminal justice system in Washtenaw County. Um, and so I would just like to put a, fa a, a face to that and, uh, and bring this, this attention to you. And uh, looking around here, uh, being the seemingly uh, sole visible Muslim in this time of, uh, in, in, in this time of tension, I would just like to issue my um, sincerest and most heartfelt um, uh, overtures of peace. You know, I do feel that you know, in the media right now, there's this sensationalism of uh, antagonism between especially, let's be honest, Muslim and Jewish communities. Uh, Southeast Michigan has a, a particular population, a concentration of Muslim and Jewish communities. Uh, my best damn friends are Jewish people. And I would like to make this clear, you know, while I have this this uh, platform right now, um, a lot of the media attention is about, you know, the uh, a lot of the media attention is about the tension between our communities. And I would just like to highlight right here in Washtenaw County, the uh, existence and thriving of, you know, coexistence between Muslims, Jews, Christians, and everybody. And so I just want to, uh, to throw some positivity out there for everyone. And um, yeah, y'all, that's all. I'll keep it brief. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Peggy of Peggy's Pancakes. <laughs> I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I live at a house of hospitality for the homeless community and have been involved in starting many of the projects that you're talking about today, including the Daytime Warming Center and other projects. Um, I, you know, I live swimming in the trauma of homelessness, and I'm not going to try to appeal to your hearts. I am tired, <laughs> just tired. And I think Jesse and Colin and the others said it better than I can. I do want to appeal to your heads, though. Um, I do want to point out some numbers that I know from your past comments you will be looking at. I'm so grateful to the Continuum of Care Board. They've done really... Um, heavy lifting in trying to bring recommendations to you. And what I want you to know is that my understanding, which I gained from talking to a county employee in a responsible position, is that there are expected to be approximately 100 unsheltered families in the county this winter. In addition to that, we heard that there are brick and mortar shelters available, but only for approximately 17 to 19 of those families. So there's a major shortfall. The Continuum of Care Board is trying very hard to fill this gap. Nobody really wants to shovel money at hotels, I get it. And with better um, HOC performance, hopefully those hotel stays can be reduced. But when you start adding up the numbers, I know you will dig into those. And I think you will see you probably are not going to have any other options for unsheltered families in the winter, this coming winter. In particular, I want to point out that the Continuum of Care Board, they're trying to be creative. They're trying to deal with a nearly impossible situation. It's not showing, throwing any shade in their direction. 25 families in faith based buildings in church or synagogue or temple buildings, mosque buildings, that, that's what they're trying to do. I laud them for trying to do it, but I have to say in all honesty, are they gonna do it? We already see big gaps in places where faith-based communities are supposed to be filling in for rotating the men's rotating overnight shelter for the 25 men, as well as the daytime and other gaps in Ypsilanti. So are we going to launch a whole new program for 25, not individual adult males, but families with kids and, and really shelter them in um, faith-based buildings? I'm very skeptical, and I want you to look at that because if, there is, if that does not happen, what's plan B? And right now, the only plan B I can think of is hotels. 
Thank you. Perfectly timed. Hello. Uh, my name is Stephanie Krauss. I live in Ypsilanti. Um, I didn't really prepare a lot today. Um, I actually, oh boy, this is hard. So um, earlier today, I attended my, I think, fifth eviction hearing this year. Um, every month, I'm able to figure it out. I'm lucky. I have some ability to do that. However, this has been going on all year because there is no relief, right? There's no place to go to ask for help right now and be able to actually get it. So we're just figuring it out. In fact, my situation wouldn't even be considered an emergency because my late rent is in the month that we're in, but it's every month. So I'm paying $250 extra every month because I'm paying for late fees and attorney fees to show up in court to have it dismissed. I'm not the only one going through this. I live in an apartment complex that is geared towards low-income people. I have watched my neighbors move out in droves. There are empty, vacant units all over in my complex. And I don't understand what's happening. I am currently paying about almost $1,600 a month in rent to continue to live there because I can't pay it on time. There are so many of me out there. And I just wanted to voice that tonight because my biggest fear is that one of these months, I'm not gonna be able to figure it out. And I will become one of those people waiting for a bed for four to six months. And I don't think that's okay. And I don't believe that any of you do either. And you have an opportunity to do something about it, especially for those of us who live in Ypsilanti. And I'm talking about the women because the things that happen to us when we go homeless are unspeakable. And we need you to step up for us. Please do something. Thank you. Thank you. Name and city or township. Hello, my name is Madden Lynn. I live in Ann Arbor. Um, I'm coming up in response to the COC Winter Shelter Task Force. Um, they said <clears throat> that this year we have had a 48 hour family uh, shelter assessment situation. Like you only have to wait 48 hours to get um, family shelter assessment. Um, yes, that is true, but to get um, shelter is months, several months. There's hundreds of people on that wait list. Um, assessment doesn't mean shelter. There is no solutions right now for unhoused people. So please change that. Thank you. Thank you. Name and city and township. My name is Colleen McGee. I live in Ann Arbor. I'm a volunteer with the No Veteran Dies Alone program at the VA hospital and have been for about 15 years. Many of my veterans are estranged, estranged from their families and are hospitalized because there's no other option at the end of life. If a homeless vet contracts pneumonia from sleeping outside on a freezing night, I'm likely to be the one who journeys with them at the end. I ask you to ensure that none of the veterans I journey with are dying because they can't find, we can't find the money to provide a safe, dry, and warm place for people to sleep so that I'm not literally watching homeless people die before my eyes. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for this time. I have some written statements from some coworkers who were not able to make it this evening. I'll start with one. I am in my 21st year. Oh, by the way, my name is Samuel Hayes. I work for Washtenaw County for 12 years, and I live in the northern part of the city of Ypsilanti. Boom. Statement one, I am in my 21st year working for Washtenaw County. While I am fulfilled by my job, I have been saddened to see morale of county employees plummet since 2019. It isn't just due to the pandemic, and it isn't just my department. I have seen jobos, job postings remain open and not even posted. The MAG study did not increase the wages of people in my particular job at all. In fact, new people in the position will make less money once topped out than people that are in that position currently. And while it is true no one took pay cuts, I'm sure it is disheartening to know that a new individual never earn as much money as some of their coworkers. I used to recommend working for the county to my friends and family, and now I tell them to be careful which department they work for because some have endless turnaround and are constantly short staffed and underappreciated. This shouldn't be the case. Statement two. The first week the director of the front of the court arrived, she and the deputy of FOC openly joked about the director talking to the deputy of the front of the court staff. The deputy of the front of court staff referred to her team as my people, and the director responded and said, I own all of them. It was a joke that I took offense to. At our department meeting, they stated that they would no longer refer to us as my people. Management runs FOC like it is their private company instead of a government agency. The decision to put a freeze on hiring instead of following guidelines has affected the office tremendously. Team members are overworked because of the shortage of employees, and appointments are scheduled far out because there are not enough employees to process work in a timely manner. We have 16 people working the front desk, which is a catastrophe. There is little consistency when providing customer service because things change constantly. Changes are made, then change back because they didn't think the process through. Tasks are revised via email, and they call it training. When things are done in writing, the interpretation is perceived differently from person to person. There have been ongoing problems when it comes to the front desk and providing quality customer service. Customers complain about getting different answers and explanations quite often. We've had several heated meetings with management that customer service would improve if we had a designated person working the front desk instead of a different person every day. Many people have volunteered to take on the front desk as their primary job. About a year and a half ago, Steve Matthews was invited to one of our staff meetings and had very little to say. It's frustrating because I don't think management has any direction of where the train is going. I think the train is going to crash if changes aren't made. Some of the reasons for low morale in our office are inconsistency of information and treatment of individuals, constantly changing expectations, fear of retaliation of being written up. It's like they have a quarter to meet at the end of the month. Director trying to micromanage adults. The director sending an email before a meeting and telling us to listen. Lack of trust in management leaders who cannot be trusted to tell the whole story or follow up on items brought to their attention. Statement three. Dear Board of Commissioners, I want to start by expressing our gratitude for the opportunity to voice our concerns to the Board of Commissioners meeting today. We appreciate it greatly. Thank you again for your time. My coworker, Caitlin uh, KS and ICP, are both epidemiologists at WCHD. Both of us applied to and took these positions as we are passionate about the local community we serve and ensuring public health is as, as equitable as possible. With that being said, we are very aware how the epidemic your time is up, but finish the sentence. Thank you so much. Positions we are we currently hold are considerably underpaid as compared with similar similar positions in other counties across the state of Michigan. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yep. Anybody come on down, whoever's next. My name is Shannon Grosshans. I am 2733 Chapter Chair Unit C. I no longer live in Washtenaw County. I live in Wayne County. Um, Unit C, for you that don't know, is strictly friend of the court. I have been very apprehensive to come to come to the board in a public setting, fear of retaliation by my supervisor and the court administrator. And I've expressed that to the administrator about this and him and I've had conversations about this as well as Commissioner Light. We have not had as much turnover in the front of the court, in the trial court in years, in years. It is affecting our customer service. One of, one of your guys, one of Washtenaw County prides themselves in customer service. It's not happening right now. It's not, you can't get people trained. You can't keep people, especially in the court. Customer service is struggling, struggling. We need your help. We need your help getting people to stay with the county, to love their job, to want to be here. No one wants to be here anymore because the morale is so bad throughout the whole throughout the whole county and at the court. It's it's rough. It's rough over there. We have people leaving for less paying jobs because they have the flexibility of working from home. 
or flex schedules that the court is not offering that they did offer during COVID. So we know it's possible. It's just being refused. We are losing good attorneys because of that in front of the court. We can't hire people because we don't pay. So thank you. We need your help. Thank you. My name is Abigail Allman. I live in Superior Township. Um, I work for Community Mental Health. I work in the Access Department, and I come representing my union as well as my other union folks behind me. Um, I'd just like to commend my colleagues and comrades in the um, housing and houseless community that have spoken. I think that is an issue that directly affects our union members, our clients, and uh, Community Mental Health staff, and fully support um, the extension and support of the um, overnight shelter in Ypsilanti and additional funding and support for that. Um, I come to speak about um, a chronic understaffing problem that has been a problem in community mental health for um, several, I mean, years, but more pressingly since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. And I have some words from a colleague that I'd like to read. Um, I'm writing as a concerned employee who has worked for the county and CMH for more than 15 years. I'm writing as I'm worried that CMH staffing is dangerously low. Staff are overworked and overwhelmed. Many don't take lunches or breaks, work when we are sick, and don't use vacation time we earned as there is not enough staff to cover the work we do. Morale lower than, lower than ever. There appears to be a disconnect as our agency celebrates that we can now serve more people than before due to CCBHC in the millage, but access to services are the worst it's been in all the years I've worked here. We can now only open people to services, which is wonderful, but we don't have the staff to serve those people. Many people are waitlisted for services like therapy or referred out to other resources in the community. Our staff work here because we care about the people and we are not able to serve our clients like we want to. We desperately need to hire new staff and retain the experienced staff that we have. The biggest barrier to hiring new staff is very low wages compared to neighboring counties, hospitals, and other mental health agencies. We live in the most expensive counties in Michigan, and yet our wages don't reflect this. Many of the CMH jobs that we struggle to hire for are traditionally female-dominated jobs, social workers and nurses that are underpaid and undervalued. CMH wages are much too low. For example, I have a master's degree and I've been with the county for more than 15 years and pre-COVID almost my entire check went to daycare. I was left with $200 for the entire month after paying childcare costs. The cost of childcare is much higher now if you can ever even get a spot with wait lists. Uh, for those of us who have been through um, union negotiations in the past, we fully expect the county and HR to fight for us for improved benefits and wages when we negotiate our next union contract. The message we've received is that the county does not value or care for us. We are replaceable and there is no incentive to stay. There are many staff who have these who have these and other concerns. I have several staff this week. They were writing in today. The response I got was, it doesn't matter anyway, and I've given up. There's also fear of retaliation for expressing concerns, even anonymously. I encourage the county to survey staff about concerns anonymously to get a picture of staff concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'll run up. I'm uh, David G. I'm from Ypsilanti. Um, I'm a community mental health uh, worker. I've been with this county for five years, five years in Wayne County before that. Um, most of the time, been a very proud uh, mental health uh, case manager. Uh, got, to, got to be there for lots of different, uh, you know, good and bad times for people's lives. Um, so yeah, it's really fulfilling and great. Um, I have fewer and fewer coworkers as the weeks go by. Um, I can't get a straight answer from my administration about what their plans are to help us get staff. All I can assume is, is funding, and, and it, it clearly comes through here. Um, there are things that are happening. I, I, there are, there's a lot more people at this meeting than there was you know, six months ago. There's lots of things that just don't seem to really be changing that I think the people in this room have some measure of control over. Um, and I'm hoping that you feel empowered to look at that position and look at what we're saying here. Um, Cause I don't know, you know, I don't know if we can say anything we haven't heard yet. Um, we've all been here, you're all here, you're being quiet, you're listening to us um, and we appreciate that. Um, it's something, I mean, we, we need, I need more coworkers. They're wonderful people when we can find them. 
if they will stick around, but um, yeah. Uh, to give some time to one of my uh, coworkers who couldn't make it here, probably running low on time, but uh, Jade um, Miller talks a bit about um, the, the the travesty that is our coworkers having to look for alternate employment on top of the work that they're already doing here, which is you know work that requires a degree in the first place, and furthermore, you know time on your off. Where are you going to cope? <laughs> where are you going to come? Up with time to put a smile on your face to think about anything else put your feet up um it's absurd and i mean you know i yeah it's i i don't know I, I i appreciate the time that's available to me i really wish that all the things that i've had to say all day were right here for me right now but they're not i'm busy i want y'all to get busy as well and you know help help make this work for us uh, we love the work we do just need, you know, our ways to reflect what they are in other other places. Help us help the folks that are here right now. They're coming to us. We don't, I don't have the keys. I don't have the keys to a place. I don't. I need, I need to be the language. Once it's there, it's gotta be there. Um, but yeah, 10, nine. We got a little bit of time left. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nicole Adair. I live in Ypsilanti. I'm also a case manager for CMH. I work at the Ypsilanti location. Um, I wanted to start out saying that um, we're the ones that the police call up, the sheriff's call, when they get one of our clients. Um, they're asking us for de-escalation um, to come out into the community with them when they have a client that's hostile, threatening, um, and they kind of have us come out to de-escalate the situation. So we're put in a really um, hard situation, very dangerous situation myself. Personally, I have been at a client's house and the sheriffs have asked me to knock on the door with five sheriffs behind me. Um, and I have no protection. Um, this gentleman was very violent, um, violent past, wasn't on his medication. So that's just saying how dangerous our job is and that the sheriffs and the police departments um, also depend on us a lot of the times. Um, we are the lowest paid uh, case management out of any other county around us. Um, that's just statistical facts that we have looked up and actually have called the counties. And we also have the highest case loads. Um, the next highest one is 55 and we are at 65 to 75. Um, and then I wanted to read something from Jason in Ann Arbor. Um, he is also a mental health professional at CMH. Um, he has have seen over 18 individuals leave their positions in the county due to insufficient wages and extremely high caseloads, among other reasons. Um, and this is uh, clients that aren't satisfied with services because they can't get the care that they need. Um, so it's hard for us to care for our clients when we have a caseload of 65 plus. Um, and so thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, um, excuse me. I'm Danielle Hoover. I'm representing myself. I'm not representing Washtenaw County or Washtenaw County CMH. I'm a resident in the city of Milan, Monroe County. Since 2013, I worked for CMH here in Washtenaw County. In our department, we provide services, excuse me, to adults living with intellectual or developmental disabilities and or mental illness. First, I was a case manager and then a supervisor last August and have been a supervisor since. I've had a caseload since day one. I don't have time to train and mentor like I would like to. As a social worker, some social work happens uh, behind the desk and some of it happens out there in the field. I don't have enough time to do either in the way that I would prefer. There are not the seasoned staff like there used to be to help with training new folks. <clears throat> Then we have people getting punished for not being trained properly or not simply being able to keep up. Staff can't keep up, it's because the workload is too high. Overall, we're short staff, there's low wages, and that's why we're short staff. Case loads are very high, and supervisors are having to do the work of case managers because of short staffing issues. Short staffing can and does lead to adverse health and safety consequences. Lastly, I'm gonna leave you with two little gems here. Number one, it's not nobody wants to work anymore. It's we have a shortage of 
employers willing to pay a thriving wage? Number two, why is it better to use the term exploitation over burnout? Because burnout makes it about workers' feelings. Exploitation draws our attention to employer practices and policies which require structural solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Lynn Cook and live in Dexter. Uh, in my 16th year for walking, working for Washtenaw County, while I'm fulfilled in my job and I can't believe of a better calling um, as a social worker, um, I've been saddened to see the morale of county employees plummet. It isn't just due to the pandemic and it isn't just my department. I've seen job postings remain open for a very long time. The MAC study did not increase wages of people in my job at all. In fact, new people in the position will make less money once topped out than people in that position currently do. And while it is true that no one took pay cuts, I'm sure it is disheartening to know that a new individual will never earn as much money as some of their coworkers. I continue to recommend working for the county to my friends and family because I do believe in CNH and what we do. However, I will continue to advocate for a county agency that is capable of so much more to support its essential staff and community. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Shannon Siegert. I do not live in the county. I'm the chair of Aspen 2733's Unit B. Um, again, I'm going to repeat myself that half of my membership are the lowest paid people in the county. Half of my membership are the most overworked, overstressed, and understaffed departments within the county. We just had a conversation recently, and I looked right at Michelle and said, I'm sorry you inherited this mess that we created. Mag didn't help us but we are losing people and we can't fill the positions. We can't recruit. There's nothing here that makes people want to be retained. The turnover is unreal. And people are like, well, can't you strike? No, we can't. But you're not going to have to worry about a strike. You're going to have to worry about the mass exodus because they are all going to leave who's left because they can't take it. They're overburdened. They're overworked. We can't catch up. Some people can't get paid for the time they are working. Some people are afraid to say anything, especially in community mental health. I have no problem standing here and saying they're overworked, overstressed, because they can't, because guess what? They have minimums and requirements from the state for their licenses. If they stand here and tell you everything that's occurring, they could lose their license to work at CMH and treat clients. I can't lose my license for telling you it's occurring. And I feel like we keep coming to the board, not just for our wages, but for the recruitment that's not happening. The wages are part of the problem. My sign says job openings, undervalued, underpaid, overworked, short staffed, no pension. Does that appeal to anyone else up here? Because the upper echelon keeps adding jobs, but we can't sustain a 2% for the people that are dying out here. And I feel like some of the commissioners tonight while I've been watching are extremely bored with what we have to say. Like, it's just an imposition that they're here. You sit out there. I sat out there for the first half of the meeting. I work part-time at the homeless shelter so that I don't become homeless because this county doesn't pay me enough to live. And we got people in here scrolling their phones and texting. I don't think you got an important email or that big of an issue while we were sitting here tonight right now that needed to be emergent. I feel like we're boring you but we're gonna come here every month now, twice a month that we're in fall session until something changes. I'm on the negotiating team. We're not going home for 2% in January. So buckle up, we're gonna be here for a while. Name and city or township. Good evening, commissioners. I think most of you know me. My name is Mary Campbell. I'm the president of Ask News Local 2733, and I am here speaking on behalf of my membership. 
um, what I am here to talk about. This is not a joke. This is what we should really be posting on the website is, yes, Washtenaw County has job openings or low wages to be overworked, short staff, and no pension. So recently we came and spoke to the commissioners about the fact that you, um, you approved a significant rate increase for yourselves, a significant rate increase for the county commissioner and a golden parachute contract for the commissioner and corporation council. But we are in the midst of contract negotiations, not even out of non-economic articles through no blame to, to administration. I'm not gonna put any blame on anybody. So please understand that that's not what I'm doing. But there is some, um, expectation that we may um, have a signed contract by the end of the year when our contract is, is up. That's not going to happen. Not unless administration plans on just approving everything in our proposal that we're asking for. And I don't see that happening either. We talk about being short staffed. The first six years, seven years that I worked for the county was extremely short staffed in my department. No, nope, you couldn't even take a day off without really overworking the other person that you worked with for that. I became the president and they hired two people to replace me to, to, do, to do that. That just blew my mind. So I, it, it's ironic to me tonight that we have as many people speaking about homelessness and how many employees, how many low wage employees that we have that are just a paycheck or two away themselves from being homeless. So ironic to me that that is happening. So I kind of, you know, I'm just ad-libbing this and trying to talk about as the president of my local, I speak to a lot of employees. So especially within CMH, the last time I stood up here, I spoke to you about the fact that they can't even hire case managers because of the low wage that they offer them, but the surrounding counties and municipalities will offer them a much higher wage. And, and so the, because they're so short staffed, how overworked they are. And to be able to even give quality care that the consumers need or require is almost next to impossible for them to be able to do that. The fact that 3052 is, has, um, 3052 is having to hold caseloads because 20, they can't hire people for the 2733 unit work. Thank you, time's up. You're welcome. Everybody else, come on down. Name and city or township. Hello folks, Nancy Hyde, city of Ypsilanti. I'm also the president of Local 3052, and I also rise in support of all of the homeless folks that came out here or spoke regarding the homeless situation. I live in the neighborhood that had a lot of police presence this summer, and I'm part of the Historic District Neighborhood Association. However, I'm here to read a letter from a CMH employee that gave me permission to read this tonight. I would like to address the Board of Commissioners and others interested in Washtenaw County community mental health. I've been working at CMH since June 2000, that's 23 plus years. I've held positions for nursing at acute service house in Price's Residential. I can't even count the number of people that I have worked with, including consumers, CMH staff, hospitals, attorneys, judges, medical units, and et cetera. I no longer take time off because I feel guilty doing so when others are so overworked. I have accumulated so much sick and vacation days that I could take off over a year and still get paid. My normal work day is all day, skipping lunches and working after hours and weekends just to keep up. CMH has 66 vacant union positions. Plus you were recently approved, I believe, or eight more, five or eight more, for the BCM, uh, B, C, B, B, C, and uh, whatever it is. <laughs> so 
um, the turnover within CMH is so bad, it's hard to keep track of who's new and who is left. They come and go so quickly. Supervisors are unable to mentor and onboard their new employees because they're all taking on workload, They'll have to take on caseloads themselves. The case managers have such large caseloads that it's impossible for me to see how they keep up and how they can provide even adequate quality care. There is no incentive for people to stay. Taking away our longevity was an additional slap in the face. We've been through required furlough days, layoffs, and fear that our jobs and positions would be cut due to funding. 10 years ago, we gave up approximately 33% of our benefits and salaries, and we never got it back. Although the message we have received is that the county does not value or care for us, we are replaceable. There is no incentive to stay in order to attract and keep employees, we need to improve. Where does that start? Competitive wages, more resources. We just need to do better. I feel it may be too late and just see a never ending revolving door of employees. Need to step up CMH admin and work with the unions to resolve this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Bows in the room for public comment before I look to our friends online. Well, once said what you want to come get public comment Ashley anybody online that would like to get public comment yes chair uh first we have Beth Bouts Beth state your name and city or township Beth Bouts I reside in Dexter Township address is technically Chelsea. You got three minutes, Beth. Um, one, I want to say I've been listening. I am an employee of Washtenaw County, and I support everything I've been listening to um, my coworkers say regarding, um, you know, the the increases in the cost of living and the turnover and and a lot of the issues that are going on with the county that I think have a lot to do with funding. I think that I want to say brilliantly that the members of our community, our brothers and sisters who are homeless, who I heard speak tonight, touched me in such a way I can't even speak. And it breaks my heart to hear um, what they're going through. And I, I think that as a community, um, especially one of the richest counties in the state, there's no reason why we can't be doing better. There's no reason why that the, any, any human being and their human beings, there are our neighbors, there are community members, and they are just as important as you and me and everybody else. They deserve, and we all deserve a cost of living, and there is an issue in this county with gentrification and what the cost of living has become and how unreasonable it's become. And that's why so many of my colleagues can't even afford to live in this county because they don't pay enough for them to be able to live here. And, and I think that we need to look in ourselves as humans and what do we want Washtenaw County to be? What do we want our neighbors to be? And what do we want our brothers and sisters to have to go through? And are we willing to prioritize them or are we gonna prioritize money and businesses and, and, and out of town instead of low income housing, we're gonna prioritize multi-million dollar condos. We need to think about so all of us, because it takes all of us to live. It takes a community. Thank you. Thank you. 
Who we have next, Ashley? Next, we have Anna Taylor McCants. Anna, state your name and city or township. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Pastor Anna Taylor McCants, and I live in Ipsy Township. <laughs> Um, so first I want to say I stand with, um, my folks on the streets, um, who have spoken. Many of them are my parishioners. They are frequenters of the Fed Up Ministries food truck, um, and our organization across the county in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And I also stand with the folks who have called for sheltering in our community. Uh, what I want to say, and I, I'm feeling actually anxious. I never feel anxious. I'm a pastor speaking, but, um, I feel like the voice of God in the room, uh, since I can't see anyone right now. And, um, so I feel a little bit anxious. Uh, what I want to say is I want to empower you all as our, our elected leaders. We have voted you in because we have faith in you. You all have proven again and again that you love and care for our community. And I've seen how hard you all work. Um, and yet, sometimes the structure of these meetings makes it hard to actually get work done. I have sat in um, a couple of different spaces, the Grassroots Homelessness Coalition meetings, the Washtenaw Housing Alliance, uh, and uh, Shelter Association Winter Sheltering Committees, along with Peggy and her team from Mission. Um, and I think that what might actually be helpful in making some progress is coming to a space where you all can actually have conversations with us because I realize this is not the format for that. So I would urge you all to help find time to do that. And then as you hear solutions um, or the folks in the community uh, coming up with solutions, please act on them, do what, what feels right, but inaction is, is not helping here. Um, and as an ordained pastor, I, I do kind of have to agree with Peggy and some of the other gentlemen who spoke about um, some of the faith communities not being there answer here. Um, I love the church. I really do. I have put my all and my heart and my soul into serving the church. Um, but we are theologically trained individuals. We are not uh, trained to do the work of sheltering and housing people long term. Um, that is the work of the government. And, uh, as much, and as hard as I'm trying, you know, my congregation that I serve along with Fed Up Ministries, we open the doors to our people anytime we can. And that's just proving to when there are hundreds of individuals and families across our community that need shelter and care, it's proving to not be enough. Um, so what I want you to hear is that I think the majority of the folks in this county support you all in the work that you are doing. And, and we would love um, for you to, to own the power that you have, because in the spaces that I've been in, it's, it's very hard um, to hear one township or one organization or one council push, you know, everyone's pointing the finger to, I don't have control over that, that I don't have the money for that. I don't have the power. And I think that's about to be my time. So thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody else online, Ashley? There are. Next, we have John. John, please state your name and city or township. Yes. Uh, good evening, Board of Commissioners. Uh, my name is John Sebastian Trim. I live in uh, technically uh, District 6, uh, Ypsilanti Township. Um, I am a Washtenaw County resident as well as a employee for Parks and Recreation. I'm also on the negotiating committee for 2733. Um, I stand behind uh, what every, everyone said as far as representing the uh, union. Um, we are overworked, we're understaffed, especially CMH. Uh, they are uh, extremely, you know, I've seen them firsthand uh, and what they have do, what they do and do do on a daily basis uh, is amazing. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I've, what I've heard from so many people is that people are afraid of retaliation and, and uh, you know, uh, for speaking out. Uh, I would like to say that I first started in 2011. I left or I had to leave because I wasn't hired in full time because of the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, they didn't want to hire me for benefits reasons and I went elsewhere uh, when I was elsewhere uh, I was moving up quickly um, very quickly and I was uh, felt appreciated at my job all the time um, in the last two years I've been not been denied uh, four promotional opportunities 
uh, with the last one not even receiving an interview. Uh, and they uh, <clears throat> sought to hire outside of uh, the department. Um, you know, I, I've spoken with people that have been around in the department for many, many years. Uh, you know, the department has just celebrated their 50th anniversary. Uh, one gentleman brought to my attention, he thought that the first 35 years were the glory years of the department and the last 15 have gone down dramatically. Um, that's to put it kindly. Uh, you know, I really think that we need to, if you want to retain, uh, you know, your, your employees, you need to treat them with respect and, uh, you know, honor your, their commitment as I'm sure you guys are all committed as well. Um, but we need to have some incentive to, to keep people and to bring people in. Um, I also want to stand, you know, I stand behind all the people that had the courage tonight to, to speak out uh, for the homeless. We, we you know, I, I firmly believe that uh, a old football saying, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if your weakest link is very strong, then we are a damn good football team or community. Uh, you know, with, I know I only have a few seconds, but I, you know, I also uh, would like to let uh, District 2, District 8, District 9, and District 6 uh, commissioners, I will be getting in touch as my family has property. Thank you. What do we have next? Uh, next, we have Matt Warblow. Matt, please state your name and your city or township. Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Warblow. I am a resident of Van Buren Township outside of Washington County and Wayne County. Um, I've been an employee of Washington Community Mental Health uh, for about the past three years or so, um, but I spent most of my professional life working in Washington County in one agency or another as a social worker. Um, fortunately, I'm not able to join the meeting in today, uh, but I would like to thank the commissioners for their time and uh, listening to our concerns, as well as um, voice my uh, solidarity for the folks that are calling for you know increased shelter and uh, resources for homeless and, and housing insecure individuals in the community. Uh, today, I'm coming to, to you to speak to you of concerns that I'm sure you're well aware of. They've been iterated on in, in several cases. Um, they're mostly due to, to um, CMH and county positions in general uh, regarding compensation and retention and caseloads. Uh, these aren't new issues, but I feel compelled to join my union tonight to relay the concerns of my peers who I have the distinct privilege of working with. As you may already know from discussions during the MAG study and the implement implementation of this study, there's a distinct discrepancy in the compensation and caseloads for county employees compared to their peers in surrounding counties. Despite the vote and the attempts last year to rectify this concern, there continues to be a significant difference between um, surrounding counties and Washington County. A cursory review that uh, our, our team conducted um, found that at least on average, there's uh, uh, Washington County employees have a 26% um, a higher caseload than their surrounding counties and their starting salaries start 7% lower than comparable jobs. Uh, this has caused many issues over the years, obviously, but notably has resulted in significant issues with filling vacant positions and the retention of staff. In the three years or so since I've been at this job, I've seen the departure of at least 10 or more case managers, the vast majority of them leaving for you know, better opportunity, less workload, and better working conditions. This might not seem like a whole lot of individuals, but if you consider that our team is comprised of maybe 12 or so people, we're working with almost 800 men, uh, individuals with a mental illness. And I think you kind of get the, the picture I'm trying to paint here. Since this time, we've also seen vacant positions remain stagnant. Majority of individuals who we have interviewed with or even started with us have decided to take jobs elsewhere um, for a variety of reasons, the workload, uh, the stress of it. Um, um, we work a very dangerous job, and my, most of us, I feel, are very, very happy to do so. But um, the retention and strat staffing shortages do not make these any issues for us. It's not a new thing to us in the social work world, but I've, in my time being a social worker um, in the past 10 years or so, I've never seen it as bad as I have seen it in the past several years. Ultimately, I know this is not new information, um, but I have, we have significant concerns about the well, reports we've been hearing about contract talks and uh, the ways that admin has been working to try to address these concerns. Uh, I think most uh, folks that I talk to in my department and in the union in general feel like the admin is not taking us very seriously to address these concerns. And I'm talking to you today to implore you to uh, take these more seriously and work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, 
uh, we have Commissioner Katie Scott. Commissioner Scott. Hello, good afternoon. It is really weird to be speaking into the computer um, to talk to you all, but thanks for letting me talk for a second. Um, uh, since I'm speaking as a member of the public, my name is Katie Scott and I live in Ann Arbor. Um, I just want to thank everybody who came out. There was a lot of really, I mean, like I have been riveted to the public comments um, about what people have been saying um, about the unhoused uh, community uh, we have, what we need to do. And I, um, it, you know, as other people have come in public comment and said, I stand, I stand with people on these comments. I stand with them on this too. And I'm really hopeful we can do something um, meaningful so people aren't faced with the fear of having no place to go. Um, I just can't imagine how that weighs on somebody. Um, I also want to note for the conversation or for the people who've come to the board table today to talk about um, the morale issues and the staffing issues that they're they're experiencing. I, I hear that and will want to try to work to try to get some resolution on that. I understand how hard it is to work short staffed, something that I often do at my day job also as a nurse, and it, it is um, very difficult. I am hoping that we can get, um, I, I have been asking uh, for us to look at our functional vacancy rate. Um, I wanted to look at some of that as part of this budget process to see where we are with that. I'm hoping that will help. I'm hoping the employee engagement survey that we should have coming out at some point in the future will help guide us and how to try to help things get better. And I don't know, um, we'll have to follow up with administration and HR to talk about um, what comes out of exit interviews or are we doing them and to talk about maybe some retention interviews because I'm also hearing people talk about how they've been in service with Washtenaw County for a long time. And I'd like to hear about what's going right. And so we can continue to do those things better and then talk about um, what we can do to try to keep people here also because losing good talent and losing people who have a passion for helping other people is really unfortunate. That's all I have to say. Uh, you'll be probably happy you don't have to listen to me for the rest of the meeting, but thank you everyone who came out to talk tonight and um, thanks to my colleagues uh, sitting at the table right now. I look forward to seeing you in November. Thank you. We got a little, a little bit of applause there. Mr. Scott, and some snaps. Okay, uh, Ashley. Anybody else online? This is the last call for anybody in the room that didn't get to speak yet. That you'd like to speak, you get three minutes. Not seeing nobody else. Okay, so here's what's going to happen next. Now, commissioners can respond. After commissioners respond, I intend for us to take a brief break. We'll come back from the break, and then we will get uh, the much awaited for housing presentation. So, uh, and the queue is Commissioner Robbie and then Commissioner Labar. Anyone else give me some sort of indicator? Okay, Beeman after that, Commissioner Beeman. Gonna go ahead and call on Commissioner Robbie. I'm just trying to make it clear what's gonna happen. I know you like that. I love it, Chair. You love it. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm gonna be liberal use of the gavel as you request. Thank you, appreciate just, it. Just as an example. <laughs> All right, well, I appreciate you, Chair. Thank you for calling on me uh, in the queue. Um, so I want to start off by thanking everybody that came out tonight. It's really powerful to hear all of your voices. Every single one of you that came up and spoke, um, you know, was was inspiring. Um, and I want to start by encouraging all of you to not make this your only board meeting. Um, I strongly believe that public comment is sacred. And when you come to our public comment, when you come to our board meetings, you are exercising your rights as citizens. We need you not just at this meeting, but at every meeting that we have, and that goes for staff, and that goes for members of the public as well. Um, I wanna start off too by saying an, another thing, which is acknowledging that a lot of the concerns that were brought up by everybody that spoke, um, you know, obviously speak to something that is going on right now in our country and in our world, which is we are experiencing one of the greatest recessions that we've ever experienced in our history. It's not a recession for this Wall Street, it's not a recession for the rich. It is a recession for everyday people in this country. 
and across this planet who are struggling to make ends meet. Wealth disparity is at an all time high. I just looked it up. The latest results just came out. Top 10% own 70% of all the wealth in our country, 70% for the top 10. That's ridiculous. I wanna start by speaking to the staff um, who came out and spoke today. Um, and I wanna first say, when I started as a county commissioner in 2011, one of the things that I was shocked by is the number of staff that came to me with concerns of things that they saw at their job. But what shocked me even more was that those concerns were followed by fear. Fear for retaliation, for speaking up, and fear that even to talk to me. And it wasn't until I had developed those relationships that people knew that they could come to me in confidence and that I would advocate for their issues in confidence and, and that they could trust me. But the fact that people were afraid to speak up is a problem. And I wanna say unequivocally to every single staff member that came today, to those that are watching, to those that couldn't attend because they had childcare or that are working a second job, I have your back and you, Mary has my number, Nancy has my number, they know to call me when there's issues and other unit chairs before that have called me as well. All your unit chairs know you can call me uh, and please speak up, please come to our board meetings and for all of your supervisors and, and, and directors, department directors who are intimidating you, I wanna unequivocally say that is unacceptable culture in our organization, not in Washtenaw County. This is a county where employees should feel safe and able to speak their minds. I wanna speak directly to the mental health care workers uh, with something that uh, has been on my mind for a long time and that I've brought up repeatedly at these meetings. And that is what I've said uh, to my colleagues, I've said at these meetings, we need more accountability of mental health. We need our executive director for mental health to be at our board meetings presenting on what's going on. So far, I've been a commissioner for 10 months. We've seen her at one meeting presenting. And by the way, she didn't even present on the millage at all. We didn't hear anything about how the millage dollars are being spent. 10 months in, that's unacceptable. And I'm gonna be asked to vote for a millage renewal soon without any information about what's actually being done in that millage. We've got her budget on what she's doing. But we, by the way, we didn't even get time to ask questions, which I think is another problem that this board needs to address is time for commissioners to actually ask in-depth questions. I couldn't ask questions about the budget presentation that we just had, which I plan to ask questions later on in this meeting uh, about that. Hopefully Catherine didn't go home. Um, we're talking about retention of our county employees. And everything that you've said makes absolute sense. We need to increase salaries, we need to write better workers. But one of the things I wanted to highlight, because I was on the board in 2013, 2014, um, we need to reinstate our defined benefit pension plan. Absolutely. Uh, that is how you retain workers. That is how you retain workers, uh, because people know that if they stick with the organization, they will be taken care of in their retirement. It is dignity for our workers, for the people that put their blood, sweat, and tears in this organization, that we take care of them when they're done and when they walk away, when they retire. And the fact that we took that away is unconscionable, and we should, we should be looking at bringing that back for our workers. Um, lastly, I wanna say on the job openings, the, the vacant positions, I wanna understand, because what the administrator just said during working session is that we are looking at the, and I think Commissioner Scott spoke to it as well, we're looking at the functional vacancy we're looking at all these vacant positions and we're looking at moving things around to cover other requests that are coming in in the budget. That all sounds fine, but what I'm hearing the employees say is that we're actually not filling the positions that we need to be filling to actually do the job that is already out there. So whatever we do in terms of moving positions around to start new stuff, we better be looking at what is happening in our departments and make sure that our staff aren't being overburdened and that we're not taking positions away when we should be hiring people to do the jobs that we need to do. Um, this gets me into a quick comment that I wanna make about the budget. Again, the presentation that we had, and this is a segue into talking about housing. When we just got that bu budget, I don't know how many of you saw it, but the working session budget presentation, there were several items in there that I have some real questions about. One of those items is the hiring of a labor attorney for a quarter million dollars a year for four years. Um, why? Why are we doing that? I, I look forward to hearing justification for it, but I can tell you as of now, I am a hard no. That seems like a waste of money when we could be spending money on housing and homelessness, on staff issues. And so that's something we need to be looking at right now. And there's some other items in there too. We're gonna give, be giving a million dollars to the courts. I don't know how many of you caught that in there, a million dollars to the courts for what? What are they gonna do with that money? I'd love to understand. 
So we didn't get to go into any of that. And by the way, it's not your fault, Madam Chair, working session chair. You're only given an hour and a half to have these meetings. We need more time to discuss this stuff. We need longer working sessions. When I was on the board before, we had two nights to do this. We should take the time that we need to go through this budget. This is the people's budget. I know we have opportunities uh, to have um, uh, office hours to go through the budget with staff. This is the people's budget. Those are private meetings. This needs to be hashed out in public, on camera, so the people back home can hear. This is the people's money. This is the people's budget. We need to have these conversations here. On the housing issue, everybody who spoke today, I want to say one thing. Government is here to do big things. We are here to help people. And for too long, we have said government isn't here to help people. We have tried to get away from responsibilities. We have tried to move away from doing this or that. We have done public-private partnerships. We've you know, given uh, money to even you know, entities outside the organization when really what we should be doing is stepping up and doing big things as an organization. We have the best, trip, the best bond rating that we can as a government. Why don't we borrow money to invest in housing? Why don't we borrow money to invest in shelter? Uh, people are in need right now and we have the capacity to do it. The laws are in place for us to do that. And we just need to be bold. We just need to be bold and step up to our responsibility to act. Um, so, and one last thing I wanna say about that piece and the housing commission, there was a gentleman who spoke from the Ypsilanti Housing Commission. Um, and I, I wanna say, I, while I appreciate uh, his concerns, um, I wanna unequivocally state that the, the, the fact that the county is exploring creating its own housing commission is important and necessary in order to solve this problem long-term. While Ypsilanti has a housing commission and the city of Ann Arbor has a housing commission, and I appreciate the work that they do within their communities, I would simply ask the question, if there is an ability and a desire to operate housing outside of their jurisdictions, why has that not happened already? If we create a county housing commission, we will have the ability to operate housing in other parts of the county that aren't the city of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And by the way, there was some discussion at one of our previous board meetings about the legality of us building in other townships. Uh, there is a court case that Washtenaw County actually fought in court in 2004 before my time on the board, where we won actually against Pittsfield Township. And that court case, the court said, Washtenaw County does not have to follow local zoning. We can go and we can build and we can develop using our housing commission based on the court precedent that we have set as a county and we can build those, that capacity in other communities um, around our county in a way that uh, the other housing commissions, unfortunately, may not have that same ability. So the fact that the county is exploring this is absolutely important. I know we're gonna talk about it in just a little bit, but I do wanna push back a little bit on that comment. In closing, I wanna say thank you once again for everybody that showed up today for speaking your minds. And again, please don't be shy to come to these meetings. Uh, frankly, uh, you know, you should be able to come to that podium and say anything you want, anything that's on your mind, and you should not feel like you are a burden to us. We are elected to serve you and to listen to you and to hear your thoughts. So please come to our future meetings, uh, and, and I encourage you to do that. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's a good example of why we missed Yusuf at our last board meeting. Uh, Commissioner Barr, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, I appreciate everybody spending the time here tonight, and I know for many of you, uh, just getting here is logistically challenging. Um, I, I think the, the best answer I can give you is the most honest answer, which is, one, you're heard in what you say. Two, um, what you're advocating for is something uh, that this board to a person wants to be able to provide. Uh, the truth is that answer will never be sufficient to meet the need. Uh, we're going to have to go iterative budget by iterative budget uh, and issue by issue. And we will keep plugging along in that. But if I had an answer that I thought tonight would um, provide you a, a, a sufficient and final answer, I'd provide it to you. I, I, I don't and I won't. And I don't think anybody here will. We're going to hear the presentation in a bit with the admin plan, we will need your feedback. You are in and of the community in a way that none of the nine of us to my knowledge are. So we would benefit from hearing that. What works in that, what doesn't, what sounds good, but doesn't actually function when, uh, when rubber hits the road. 
this this advocacy um, is helpful. Keep it up. It's a, it's a it's a tension that is useful in terms of helping us make the necessary budget decisions. Um, it also highlights some of the tension we see within the organization for the many different things we do. Uh, homelessness services and mental health services. Neither one of those is more or less important than the other in the context of the human being's life. And those are both priorities. Those are both things uh, that we have to find a way to fund and fund at sufficient levels and at good levels, hopefully, uh, in, in context with all the other things that we do in the county. Um, if that was easy, we'd have done it by now. It's, it's not, I'm not asking anybody to uh, feel sorry for any of us. Um, the best we can do is give you an honest answer there that we're gonna keep working on it. Um, in, in terms of CMH, I, I spoke twice today with the CMH director. One thing that I would highlight is CMH was an outside entity that we reabsorbed into the county in 2015. At that time, when it went from Washington County Health Organization back to community mental health, there were a number of folks well-intended in the community and well-intended in the service provider community who said to us, you should make it an authority. You should make it an authority, not a function in a department of county government. One of the reasons for that was you wouldn't have to contend with labor in the same way. That is an organized workforce within CMH. One of the reasons I'm glad we reabsorbed it as a department, not an authority, is because again, that tension is helpful. That tension is something that we need. If Nancy Hine comes to this table, if Mary Campbell comes to this table and says, everything's a-okay, that's, that's the worst outcome. What we need is that habitual pressure on the nine of us to do as much as we can for our employees in the context of providing the services you all provide 65 caseload individuals at a time to the people we serve. So that is a good thing. To my colleagues, I would say one third of this board is on the CMH board. As one of those three commissioners, I welcome any and all of you at any time. Those are public meetings. We are not asking you not to attend. We're asking you to attend. CMH operates in a funding environment on a per capitated basis that is asinine and asinine across the country. And I'm not gonna sit here tonight and tell you that, that we have some Washtenaw County specific solution to that overall ecosystem, that overall environment. We can supplement what we do on wages and we should, as we have done. $1.5 million of the larger pool of money that we dedicated to uh, worker pay in the context of economic assistance was, was brought to the table through the proactive work of CMH staff. That's not insignificant. It's not enough though. Trish Cortez would be the first to tell you that. So we will keep working on that, but we need help at the legislative level in both Lansing and in DC. And we need, as Commissioner Robbie said, all of our employees to feel free to speak their mind and say their piece to exercise both their first amendment right and their moral duty as public servants to tell us their full picture of the truth. There's never a time where that isn't helpful and needed. So I will wrap my soliloquy here and I, I, I apologize, Chair. Um, we are doing the best that we can, but we can always do better. We do better when we have this feedback. When this feedback is organized as it has been tonight, it is appreciated. If we err, I hope we err as we have in the past and hope we do in the future, Air in trying to meet as much need for as many people in as many places and many ways as is possible. That's our job, is to exhaust ourselves as an organization in that endeavor. Uh, we will give it our best go as we continue on. I appreciate your advocacy uh, and I appreciate the time here tonight to speak my piece. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Beam, before you go, I just wanted to throw out that I've received some feedback that sometimes not all of us are in the shot. So as you're speaking, try to make sure you're in the frame for the viewers online or people that watch the recording. Not you specifically, I'm just saying all of us when we speak, just try to make sure you're in the shot. Thank you, Chair. I'll you're try, I'll, I'll try to not move around a lot. Um, so I also wanna thank everyone for attending tonight. It takes a lot to come uh, forward to anybody and including this body. So I truly appreciate 
hearing from each of you. Um, I believe that all of us at this table truly deeply care about our unhoused population and we want to come to a solution uh, as, as rapidly as, as we can uh, to, to save lives, to help lives, to shelter uh, our, our community. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to echo Commissioner Robbie in terms of the commission. I really want to tackle this from a holistic view. I do love the advocacy that I'm seeing from area centers such as Epsilani and Ann Arbor, but we also need to look at housing across the county. I have leaders in my district, the Southwest corner that want to know how do they come to the table? How do they come to the table to build affordable housing? How do they partner? They haven't done it before or they haven't done it within their current leadership and they want to get involved. So again, bringing more voices, more people to the table, more housing is a better thing. I think we can all agree in this room. So I'm excited, excited for that. Um, in terms of, of our labor partners, I've said this once and I'll say it again, we don't make widgets at Washtenaw County. We, we don't push anything out the door. We have people and our people are us and they are a reflection of, of everything that we do and we need to do better. We just do. There is a comment tonight about voting for salaries. I didn't, I was a no vote because I don't want to earn a penny more when you don't earn a penny more. That's not okay with me. Um, I wasn't okay with a couple of my other commissioners either. So I uh, just wanted to, wanted to highlight that. Um, there was a piece about uh, police budgets. And I did just want to clarify that we are responsible for Washington County and we work with the county sheriff. Um, who was praised tonight, as well as uh, Prosecutor Ali Savitt. Uh, we do not do anything with the local police budget. So your Ann Arbor, your Dexter, your Chelsea, any of those are not under us. Those, those are local municipalities. So we have nothing to do with those budgets. I just wanted to make that clear. And um, there was one point about scrolling on phones and I will totally admit to that. Um, my partner in crime, Commissioner Scott's not here and I will out myself that I've been texting her because she and I tend to have a couple little comments back and forth or pass a little note when we hear things. So that's who I've been on the phone with. Sorry, Katie, you called us out. Um, but thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Somerville. Make sure you're in the shot. All right, thank you. Um, I think the folks from Legal Services are still here. Hi, um, I just wanna thank you for all the work that you do. Um, in over the last five years in my like day job and now as a county commissioner and even when I was on city council I refer a lot of people to legal services because you're my first answer anytime someone has an issue with their landlord or um, are at risk of eviction or have any other weird um, situation like elder um, I guess when when senior citizens often get misled um, with financial crimes, um, I typically refer them to legal services. I'm really glad that you're in downtown Ypsilanti. Um, I was really happy to see you in our packet tonight, and I'm really hopeful that we'll approve the resolution to continue supporting you all. Um, and I, I do want to talk a little bit about community corrections um, because I'm the commission liaison for that um, body. And so um, when when we were informed that that program would be disrupted, my immediate reaction was people will automatically be placed in jail with all those um, tethers. And that means people lose jobs, lose housing, it disrupts families. Um, it was kind of, um, it was a terrible decision to have to make, but the reality was not continuing the program, at least the way that with all of the information I was given, it was going to end. And the consequences of that were not something that I could sleep well with at night. Um, I wasn't here when the MOU was agreed upon to allow the county sheriff to um, essentially roll over dollars year to year. Um, I don't agree with that policy, but the decision that we made a few weeks ago, it wasn't about that. It was about making sure that the program that has done a lot to prevent disruption in families and just people's lives, it continued. Um, I 
have consistently just in my time in public service voted against increasing police budgets. Um, the community corrections budget is unique in that it was placed within the sheriff's department. And so it just, it costs more and it's not even the money for me. It's the fact that someone would have to be in jail for even one night that I just couldn't sit with. So I just wanted to clarify, um, I, you know, I think that future sheriffs will not have the same agreement. I feel confident in saying that. Um, and I am, you know, advocating that we use those excess dollars for things like supporting um, permanently supportive housing. And the sheriff has talked, you know, about that since the last meeting. So I just wanna say it's not perfect, but I continue to push for more funding for permanent supportive housing from the millage that the voters adopted and where taxpayer dollars are going. Um, to county staff, um, I just, I wanna thank you for being here. Um, it's not easy, especially when you feel like you could be retaliated against. Um, for the people who work for the county that live in district six, um, I just want you to know that you should always feel um, comfortable and welcome to call me, um, email me. I will meet with you. If you don't feel comfortable sending an email and you wanna talk in person, please just let me know. Um, I think that toxic workplaces, and especially in government, um, it's just a huge failure. Um, I love government. I This position and my full-time job, I work in government, and I don't want people going to work um, with the emotional baggage of not being able to um, just do their job for the people that we're supposed to be serving. So thank you um, so much for sharing that with us. Um, I don't think any of us want people to feel that way who are working for the organization. Um, and then specifically, um, I know we had the first half of public comment was really focused on the housing crisis. We know that it's a crisis that, that has been growing um, nationally and in Washtenaw County, while we've had a history of being kind of leaders, um, like Avalon Housing was one of the first permanent supportive housing organizations in the state of Michigan. Um, we're just at a point right now when I walked in to the county board um, room in January, we had a bubble of family homelessness and we could barely keep up with that. Um, I know that we have tried really hard to act um, urgently in those emergency family crises. I'm really excited to see what staff is gonna be presenting later. Um, I think a combination of what we saw earlier tonight at working session with the folks that are really experts in emergency sheltering at the Shelter Association and the Washtenaw Housing Alliance in combination with staff and public comment, I think that we're gonna have some really good results with all of this. So your advocacy, um, is much you know, appreciated and supported. Um, I think that hopefully by this time next year, we'll all feel like good about this and that we're going in the right direction. The reality is we need more permanent supportive housing. Um, we need more housing generally in Washtenaw County. Um, I know that as a body, we've talked um, frequently this year about our commitment to really um, think outside of the box, to try to get our local partners to build more um, and I've talked about this before. I don't know if I've talked about it at this table, but as Michigan has positioned um, itself as kind of, you know, a safe haven for the climate crisis, I really think it's important for us to center that in the fact that poor people, people who have experienced chronic homelessness throughout their lives will continue to be pushed out of safe um, and accessible housing and prison and jail could end up being the housing solution. And that's just not, that's something that we can prevent as long as we, all work together to um, accomplish more housing for everyone. And then specifically, Stephanie, I love you and thank you for speaking. I know that wasn't um, easy. You weren't here during working session, but one of the things that we talked about was eviction diversion. And sometimes we think about like, once you get to eviction court stopping, um, and you mentioned that you've done that a few times. One thing that I think we can do um, is really, you know, one could look at it as universal basic income or just gap funding for housing. When someone is paying $900 a month for housing and then you get your lease for the next year and it's increased $300 a month, where do you go when you can't afford that? Because there is nowhere cheaper than where you're already at. So um, it's more cost effective for us to just meet the gap than um, how somebody wants they're already homeless. It's more expensive. So I really do appreciate you sharing that. It, it was a perfect example of what I think we could do to both keep people housed and safe. And it's just more, it's just more cost-effective. Um, 
And so, and we know that if we prevent the eviction from ever happening, we save money. So um, we know that we need to pay our employees more. So why not save money on allowing people to get evicted in the first place? And then we can work on all of these issues together. So they're all inter interlinked. So thank you so much and I will stop now. Anybody else for public comment? Not seen any. Anybody that hasn't spoken yet? No, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Robbie. Thank you. I will be brief, and this is not directed towards any of my colleagues, but more so something that uh, I was reminded of uh, just now and that I wanted to say in the context of the discussion that became heated with the sheriff at a previous meeting, um, and that is, regardless of what happened previously with the MOU, the reality is, is that the sheriff's office has $6 million in fund balance. And it is my belief that because of that, the board should not be giving the sheriff's office any more money, given the amount of money that he has on fund balance. That's all I want to talk. Anybody else before we move on to the next phase here? I'll be real, nope, nope. Okay, I'll be brief because I know people want to see the presentation. Uh, I would say thank you to all the staff that came out. I want to draw attention to that we received a number of written public comments too that you can see in board portal. Most of the written public comments are about similar to what we received here related to staffing issues uh, and housing and homelessness. Um, there were a couple related to senior services advocating that we pass uh, what we passed last time. So for those of you that asked us to do that, we did it last time. So you, you'll be happy about that. Uh, please stay tuned after the after the break that we're going to take for the housing presentation. As I mentioned during working session, my hope is that we'll have this really, what I expect to be a fantastic presentation, a robust discussion, and for us to really talk about what sorts of pieces of the housing and homelessness crisis Washtenaw County is going to take responsibility for, and then where can we lean on our local government partners and community partners uh, to figure out where everybody fits in the puzzle. So with that, if there's no... Uh, Objection. Let's take a 15 minute break. 15 minute break. All right.
Get everybody at home to come back. You, you like that, Yusuf? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to move into the presentation. So we're not going to do the whole report from the county administrator. We're just going to do this first part. And then we'll do the other things that we have to do that are particularly uh, pressing for time. I know that our water resource commissioner has another commitment. I told him we'd get him out of here as quickly as possible. We got a closed session. So, Evan, you're going to have to wait for this, but I know you're very excited for the housing and homelessness presentation as well. You're going to get that. We'll do your resolutions. We'll go into closed session and we'll take the rest of it as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Take us away, Administrator Dill. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, Esteemed members of our community, thank you. Forgive my back. I wanted to make sure that you know that your comments uh, were very helpful this evening. And what you hear today is will continue to be at a high level until such time as we've had a chance to engage with our community. We feel like you all are thought leaders in this space and don't want to create anything that hasn't been appropriately vetted by the community. So I'd like to begin by thanking Amanda. Carlisle and Dan Kelly for their work around our response to winter sheltering. That is still under creation. We wanted to co-create our response. We will continue to do that work and continue to look for opportunities to make certain that we have the appropriate response to homelessness in our community. So to where we're at today, as, as you all know, we were before you a few weeks back and we talked at a high level about the history around our homelessness response in Washington County. Tonight, we wanna talk more about our response to what we've heard from uh, our internal stakeholders and, and thought leaders. We wanna talk about next action steps and talk about how we invest long-term strategically in this work. So as we put together this second phase of this presentation, I asked the team in administration, the team at OCED, and uh, our thought leaders in the space, including the WHA leadership and the continuum of care to think about a couple of things. Ask them to go deep in how we look at this work, to help us engage with the community in the most appropriate way, and to co-create a response that is transformational, deals with all of the issues surrounding this space, is humane, and is aligned with our community values. So again, this is a process for us, and we hope to continue that work as we move forward. This to work, so you might need to pass the slide. Next slide. Sorry, my clicker won't. So as we've talked about this work, and, and trust me, we have spent most of our energy and administration working on our response. One of the phrases that has been illuminated as we move through this work is that we are the safety net for the safety net. Washtenaw County is really the organization or entity that we look, through, look to in Washtenaw County to make sure that folks in crisis, people responding to trauma, wherever it exists, that we respond. And we are thinking differently about what we do and how we do it. This slide just really talks about the roles and responsibilities of those who work in this space. Uh, with Washtenaw County as the center, you can see the functional roles. I won't spend a lot of time here. Uh, and the entities that are at play in moving this whole thing forward. I wanna lift up a couple of pieces. At the top of this, the County Board of Commissioners. You all will drive our response and our investment in this work. And our goal is to make sure that we have recommendations that again are steeped in our community values. Uh, one of the uh, boxes up there, the continuum of care. Uh, that work and that space, that thought leader uh, will continue to be present as we build out this work moving forward. Next slide. In terms of our uh, initial engagement, these are the entities that we have looked to, to provide uh, a reaction to what we're recommending, to provide uh, a space for us to continue our discussions and to be the thought leaders of, around what we create, again, co-create for our community. Uh, you see them listed there. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. What is missing and what we hope to lift up next is our opportunity to engage with community. That is the folks that are in this space this evening 
And as we think about how we engage, how we go to uh, various parts of our community to make sure that there is an opportunity to form a space for us to continue these important discussions. Is it working? All right, thank you. All right. Uh, so as I thought about this work and what I asked of the teams that have been present in the space is to think about it in, in three large buckets or categories. One, as we've talked about earlier today and we'll continue to talk about and we'll continue to lean into at the request of this body is that we address the groups, the people that are in immediate crises. As we did last sheltering season, we will do all that we can to make sure that we respond appropriately as we move into the months where we know sheltering is uh, most impactful. And then I wanna talk about broadly the system that is currently at play, because as we know, we need to make sure that we think about transformation of that system and transformational change in that space. So there's a little bit on that, but then to move to what I think should be the foundation of our response moving forward, and that is long-term solutions, solutions that are strategic, that address our capacity concerns in Washington County. Because as we all know, we can continue to talk about how we navigate through this space, but if there isn't additional capacity at the end of this rainbow, we will continue to struggle to respond appropriately, appropriately to our community. So again, the, the proposal, as I've talked to many of you about on this board, our, our thought leaders in this space and my team includes three components, a short-term or immediate response. Uh, and included in, in that is our response to homelessness. Uh, but I do wanna lift up a couple of the bullets that you see up there, stabilizing and expanding uh, our Hawk framework. We, as, as a county, took over that work uh, over, the, over this past year, and we did so out of a, an abundance of caution and the understanding that we need to, needed to make sure that the entry point into this work, and into this space, was reasonable and appropriate and created the appropriate triage response, responses. So you'll hear more about that. You also heard me talk about, I heard repeatedly during comments from the community around how we convene spaces for us to continue to build out this work. We are planning a series of housing summits moving into 2023 that are focused on creating new designs in this space. Uh, so I ask you to continue to be present in the space and to please participate as we lift up those pieces. To our intermediate response, I think it is going to be critical to make sure that the wraparound services, many uh, of which are included in uh, that second uh, arrow, are, are reasonable and appropriate. We've been talking about master lease agreements, support for an eviction court, the response to those that are in eviction crisis. I see those as critical components of the work as we continue to move things forward. Uh, we've had a number of generative discussions around land bank. I know that that cake isn't baked, for lack of a better term, but we do need to continue to have those kinds of discussions. And then to what I, I opened with, we need to make sure that as we move into the future that we address issues of capacity. And you see opportunities on the screen to do much of that work. So to the short term, uh, I just wanna lift up again a couple of these bullets. One, uh, stabilizing Hawk. Much has been made of us using temporary staff to operate that space. Uh, I think that that is not the appropriate framework for us as a community. And as we think about what we do in that space moving forward, to move to making those permanent positions in our community, I think illustrates the urgency that's necessary to ensure that the entry point into our systems is solid and stable. Uh, and to perform ongoing system-wide funding and services assessments. It's not enough to move through this space and make a funding recommendation and walk away. We need to, on an ongoing basis, continue to evaluate, develop a series of key performance indicators and look to shift our funding model in alignment with changes that we know exist in our community. The homeless population has 
has been has been talked about this evening, talked about in spaces nationally, is increasing. So the narrative that we can make a decision on a specific date and have that be a static decision just will not work in this space. And we've seen play out over time that that kind of strategy is just not effective. And as you can see, I won't read all of this for the sake of time. Certainly there'll be more than uh, enough opportunities for us to continue to think about this in a strategic way. Uh, this slide is meant to say that our response will be inclusive and collaborative as we move through this system and move through uh, our opportunities to invest in this work. Uh, the convening of housing summit and regional discussions with not just community, but certain geography points in our community is vital. Uh, we have to respond to trauma wherever it exists in our community. And that means we're gonna take this show, this conversation on the road and make sure that all sectors of our community have an adequate voice in what we create moving forward. And oh, by the way, for commissioners, please stop me at any point. If you have questions, I wanna make sure that you have the opportunity to, to address it, not just this evening, but as we think about how we build out the system moving forward. Uh, to some of our intermediate strategies, uh, securing master leases is something that we've talked about repeatedly, not just in uh, this Board of Commissioner space, but as we talk with uh, our thought leaders in the community, we've talked a lot about you know, the ability to have an impact on capacity through uh, lease agreements. Guaranteed basic income uh, to lift up a pilot program, I think will yield tremendous benefit We've had a number of generative discussions on my team about what that can look like. And I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that we will continue those discussions uh, as we move forward. And so that final bullet, I know there's a lot of space for additional discussion around what a land bank can and could do in our community. I know that we are not, all not on the same page with uh, what outcomes related to a land bank can produce. Uh, I'm hoping that we can continue those discussions as we move forward. And again, this is a, another slide that I, I think tells the story of us trying to do the right things uh, in, in a framework that will make sense for our, our community. Do want to lift up the uh, bottom right corner of the slide and talk about eviction courts and diversion. There's been a lot of discussion with our courts about what that can look like. And I've talked to many of you about how we invest in that work moving forward. Uh, and as you know, and as you heard this evening on a number of occasions, making sure that people don't access that system in a negative way is important because that is certainly a costly way to respond to that work. And we wanna make sure that our diversion efforts are aligned again with community values. Long term, we know that capacity is going to be the driver around all of this work. I've heard from a number of you all that at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that we are investing in creating additional capacity in our community. And our recommendations moving forward will certainly uh, include an opportunity for us to continue to work to add capacity. That can be done in a number of different ways direct investment from this body and in both the work and in others who are operating in the space. We continue to have you know, conversations with our community partners about capacity uh, related conversations in the community and strategies that, that will move us forward in that space. And uh, that last bullet talks about affordable housing projects with other developers. You've seen us invest in some of that work moving forward. We wanna continue to lift those kinds of things up and, and to continue to invest in that work as well. Again, another slide, really the last slide that talks a little bit about, you know, what we think makes the most sense, uh, working with our, not only our established housing commissions, but as you heard from commissioners this evening, to look broadly at what the county might be able to do if we think about that system differently. Uh, a community development corporation and what that could look like. Those are efforts that I believe will create a, a sustainable 
uh, and a new path around this work moving forward. Um, and I, I won't go into that uh, last uh, bullet because there's much work to do around uh, direct financial support for our housing projects. We do wanna make sure that we leave space uh, and time for us to appropriately engage our community in the strategies that we develop moving forward. This slide is only meant to illustrate to everyone that we continue to invest in this space uh, and not meant to say, hey, we're doing everything that we need to do or that we're doing everything correct. Uh, but I do think it speaks to the willingness of this board to continue to invest in this space pre, during the pandemic, post pandemic. And as you can see, uh, our investments were static for a number of years leading up to the pandemic. We, we leaned into the space uh, heavily uh, from a financial perspective over the course of the pandemic. And now as we think about coming out of the pandemic, you can see that our investments are above the pre-pandemic levels. And again, this slide is not meant to say that we're doing everything that we need to do from a financial or investment perspective only illustrates that we continue to make this uh, the priority for uh, this organization and the community. I will say before I, I leave this slide, and you all have heard me talk about this work as being community work driven by the community and not just county work driven by the county, because I think we get better results, uh, better return on our investments when the community is at the table helping co-create our solutions. We don't want to have one jurisdiction be responsible for moving this work forward, but rather having us co-create the work and thinking about the work in uh, a much broader and a much uh, more macro level. So with that, I'll talk about a number of, of next steps. You continue to hear me say engagement should be at the hallmark of, of moving all of this forward. And I look forward to not only convening the housing summit, but convening opportunities to have our, our community lean into this space and helping us create a path forward. Uh, I would like to entertain not just in this space, uh, create opportunities for discussion, feedback, whether that be one-on-one -on -one small group or in a community forum, that is certainly gonna be uh, another opportunity for engagement as we think about moving forward. Uh, and then uh, hopefully at the end of this, this piece, we will make recommendations that make sense and that are again aligned with community values and make recommendations to this body that will include uh, investing in this space in a way that makes sense, not just in the immediacy of any crisis that may come up, but long-term as we think about strategies moving forward and think about investing in capacity, we need to make sure that we're investing in this space for the long-term. So I am going to stop right there and afford the commissioners an opportunity uh, to respond to what you've heard to this point. Uh, certainly I am joined by members of, of my executive team, uh, the team at OCED. And certainly if we don't get to all of your questions this evening, uh, we stand ready to provide answers to any questions that you might have that don't get answered this evening. Okay. Thank you, Administrator Dill, and thank you to the team. I know a tremendous amount of effort went into this presentation and the development of the variety of strategies that were listed there and that we'll talk about uh, tonight. The queue has already started, starting with Commissioner Somerville, then Commissioner Robbie. I think Commissioner Beeman, was that an eye contact that you want to get in the queue? Maybe. Maybe it is. Well, I'll, I'll put you in the queue there. Uh, there you can get in there, you can get in there fourth. I'm keeping track here. Uh, so... There's a lot more research and information that the team has that went into the development of the slideshow. Like any good PowerPoint, uh, it's light on text. So that doesn't mean it's light on information though. So the team does stand ready to answer any questions. I'm sure of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're gonna go ahead and start with Commissioner Somerville. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, mine are mostly comments. Um, to the extent possible, um, I'm most interested in us focusing on like two areas. I really think eviction prevention needs to be like 
ramped up and elevated to like the extreme because it's cheaper for us to prevent the eviction in the first place. Um, there are a number of ways I think that we can be creative about that, but it's just, it just makes sense. Um, the second thing is like stabilizing the folks, especially families that are currently homeless. I like like the mid-level um, suggestion of the master lease. I know that's going to take some time, um, but I just, those are like the two things that I think um, over time will save us the most money and keep the most people stable. Um, when we got the presentation earlier from Amanda and Dan, obviously staffing for the partners that we work with that do emergency sheltering is an issue. And so um, at the risk of making people mad, I just want to say I struggle with like increasing a physical shelter when we know that we're understaffed right now. So I'm really concerned about staffing and safety for people who are both working and living um, or sleeping um, temporarily at some of our overnight shelters. So um, I know that part of the plan is increasing uh, wraparound services through Hawk, but for our partners, um, I'm also interested in how we can better support them because it seems to me like staffing issues for them are getting, have been serious and how can they keep doing that good work if they don't have the staff support? And so I'm just like generally concerned about like the ability to grow capacity and space for shelter if we can't fully deal with what we've got right now. Um, and then I've brought this up a few times too. Um, I know that earlier this year, we made some decisions to invest dollars in like temporary emergency solutions to housing and homelessness. I guess I'm just saying this so my colleagues can hear it. I really want us to increase GF dollars every year in what we're spending on this. Um, and I'll stop for now. I'll probably do a round two later. All right. We'll get to you for round two, I'm sure. Uh, all right, go ahead, Commissioner Riley. So enthused. <laughs> you know, I was not so enthused there because I was going to say something, but then you know, right, it slipped right. my mind. I'll come back. I'm always excited to hear what Well, I appreciate that. So thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, a few comments uh, from me too. Uh, not, not so many questions, but um, first is a small one. Uh, hopefully in future presentations, we can, I know you said it wasn't an inclusive list, but on the engagement slide, uh, since we have Ann Arbor Housing Commission on there, obviously we want to make sure that Ipsy Housing Commission is on there too. Um, I wanted to just make a couple comments. Uh, obviously, as you know, I think the my number one, one of my number one priorities, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Somerville for noting hers, uh, but you know, one of mine is uh, is the development of a housing commission. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed to see that it says <clears throat> long-term study housing commission. Uh, as, as like a long, I mean, I, I know that the housing commission itself is a long-term thing, but I'd like for us to act more quickly on the actual studying process. Uh, hopefully that's not what you meant by putting it in the long-term category. Like it's not gonna take three years to study it. Um, I'd like to get the ball rolling. I mean, I can see if it's three years before we start actually doing anything, but go ahead. That's a great point. And, and some of those things will have to happen concurrently and uh, certainly not meant to say, uh, hey, you know, we won't start on uh, building out that framework immediately. I think there are all of those things really need to start immediately and, and happen concurrently. It may take us longer to get to uh, something that you all see as actionable, but we will start on that immediately. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just, I guess, a word of caution about a couple of things and then an overall thought. Um, on the land bank, uh, I did vote to create the land bank uh, many years ago. And... <clears throat> I have learned a lot since then. Yeah. Uh, I think there could be value to doing a land bank. However, what we have seen often in communities is that it becomes a vehicle that is can be predatory um, and can take people's homes, frankly, and tax foreclosure and turn around. And uh, I believe uh, I framed it uh, to the treasurer as it becomes a, a buffet for developers. Uh, and that, can have negative consequences for our community, especially if we're displacing people um, from their homes where we could be working to keep them in their homes. I think if we're talking about a land bank that has a limited scope, that has pretty strong guardrails on it to make sure that 
um, the properties that are being repurposed are being repurposed for a clearly public purpose and not for, you know, private profit, um, maybe. But I think that I just want us to be very cautious as we go down that road. Um, I've my uh, let me say it broadly. Uh, I am. I have a close uh, associate uh, who is a property owner, uh, lives in a nearby, uh, not in Washtenaw County, but a nearby uh, community in Michigan that has a land bank um, and has experienced said land bank in a very predatory way, uh, in a way that actually the land bank is actively trying to uh, take property, not just sort of as like a benevolent, like, oh, we're here when the property goes into foreclosure, but actually trying to get people out of their houses to like take the property and then spin it around for develop like large developers that happen to be very active in said community. Um, so I just want us to be cautious as we go down that road, let's make sure there's strong guardrails. Um, and I will be very um, cautious on that item. Um, the second one, unless you wanted to respond to that. If I may really quick, so, uh, and uh, quite honestly, I will have to take that one because there are members of my team that suggested that we remove that item from the presentation. And I'm the one who said that it should stay there. Listen, we've talked about this being a co-created document. And when it was suggested at the outset that we explore that, it is on the table until such time as we collectively take it off the table. So yeah. I, I hear you, and I know that if we if this is something that we're going to move forward, it will have, as you described, have, will need to have the appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I think I think something like that with the proper guardrails paired with a housing commission, potentially. But as long as again, we're not that it's not targeting, that it's not predatory, and that we're putting strong guardrails on it. So I mean, I think it's worth having a conversation, but I will just be very cautious on that item. Um, last thing I wanted to say in terms of my thoughts. The master leases, I, I get where you're coming from on that, and I think it could be a good stopgap, but in the, I feel that in some ways this creates a similar situation to what we have with hoteling where, you know, we, we're not owning the properties. We're just kind of leasing and then subleasing, right? That's my understanding of how it works. And I feel like, again, getting back to what I said during response to public comment, like we have an opportunity to make big investments, to actually purchase properties and, um, have more control because ultimately there are landlords that will control those properties and they will control the conditions on those properties and why we will why we will have some say as the county um i you know in the end i don't think that's that is a band-aid to me and not a long-term solution or even um i know it says one to two years to impact but i don't want us to like keep using that um in into the future if we can have other systems like the housing commission in place where we're making the physical investments in new housing stock or purchasing existing housing to transition to affordable. Um, and then the, the last quick thing I'll say be, um, is the chart that has the investment. Um, I hope that we rethink that chart. <laughs> I think, I don't know if this is what Commissioner Somerville was uh, speaking to, but I, I think it is a good, display of how much additional money we've spent recently on housing. However, it's concerning to me that it shows a spike in housing investment and then a decline in housing investment. Um, don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Uh, perhaps it can be reframed because uh, there could be other sources of revenue uh, in the future that could help supplement what the general fund is providing. But I don't think that we should certainly be declining our uh, investment in this area, or yeah, I, I just think that chart doesn't sit well with me in general. So I get it, I understand it. And I don't, I don't disagree. What, what I will say to everyone is that the data doesn't lie. That's what we're investing currently in the space. And as a board, uh, if you all want to see additional investment in it, that's the foundational component. I do think that there's an opportunity for us to rethink how we present the data and and contextualize the data uh but again I, I you know it's it's difficult for us to just talk about solutions without really leaning into here's how we're investing in the work and then lastly i have received a number of calls and comments from people operating in the space that say that the county is reducing 
their investment in certain spaces. And I wanna make sure that we, we speak intelligently about what we're doing. So I hear you, we'll look at that and look at, look at it differently as we move forward. But, but you, you look like you had a follow up. What were you thinking? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I mean, I have some more. okay. I mean, you grimaced at the last thing the administrator said there. Look like, it, I didn't mean to. No. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm, 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 used, grimacing is, I'm used to those uh, facial expressions. So. Happens. You know, I sit next to him. So. Yeah. Did you want to take that? I got you in the queue. You want it? You, go for it. Um, so obviously, as I had mentioned, I'm really excited about engaging community partners and there are leaders in my district, District 3 specifically, that are interested in helping to solve this um, housing issue. And I will beat this horse until it is completely dead. There's funding from the USDA for low income housing that I have in Manchester. Um, it's the only one in Washtenaw County. And we need more of it. It's money that I feel like is sitting on the table that we need to utilize. Um, so that's uh, how, how are we engaging them? That's kind of how I'm wrapping this in. Thank you. Thank you. Do you got anything to say about that? I think that's kind uh, of the, the only thing that I'd say is that that requires additional uh, exploration. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we don't miss any opportunity to leverage any funding that's available. We have that on the list. We'll follow up with you on, on that piece. I follow up really quick. Oh, yeah, okay. do it. Sorry. I just meant how are we bringing like the other leadership to the table? So, Celine, Mylan. Yeah. So, so that engagement strategy still needs to be developed. Uh, we will have that to you guys uh, by the next board meeting. Uh, we want to create, uh, as I talked about earlier, a space for those conversations to happen, not just in this boardroom, uh, but take our, our presentation, our, our opportunity for engagement on the road, and we'll need your, your assistance in helping us, uh, you know, create that framework. I would just add in the middle of the conversation here that I Part of what I'm hoping for out of the discussion we're having is figuring out what do we as the county want to invest in, and then we do the road show and engage local partners. They can figure out, okay, we're going to do that part. So as we have the discussion, I think everybody should be keeping track. You want, I know you want to get in round two. Yeah, uh, just hold on. So we're all, I, I, you know, administrators are always taking notes. Taking notes of what everybody likes, doesn't like, and then we'll come back with a more thorough thing for us to vote on and say, that's ours. We're going to do that part. Go ahead, Commissioner LeVar. And then, yeah, I see you're in the queue for round two. You're in the queue for round one. Don't I've got it. Yeah, you would need to be. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Labar. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a quick note on the chart. The if I'm recalling correctly, we contributed a static one and a quarter million dollars to coordinated funding for about a decade, and I think that's reflected on the chart. And then the ARPA bump. Um, previously, at this board table, I talked about a desire to see either a doubling or tripling of that 1.25. And yes, I was, you know, being ambitious and aiming high uh, in, in terms of social, social safety net funding, housing uh, to be a part of it. Through some of the things that we've done, we're, we're getting there, uh, but I, I think more work to go. Uh, Administrator Dill, though, what, what I need to know here is Five and 10 year takeaway from the plan as it's laid out, I understand the vision we're trying to get to, but in the immediate term, I, I, I need to hear more on the, on the proposal summary under short-term immediate impact. We talk about maintain system support, stabilize and expand Hawk, add case management. What is the meat on the bone in terms of when, how much, and what is the impact on sort of human lives and, and, and when? We heard a comment earlier tonight uh, from a, a, a young person who spoke about, you got the assessment down to 48 hours and that's good. But if you don't then have corresponding availability of property or other resources, uh, that case management, you know, you, 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 you're, you're still in the same spot. How quickly can we expand Hawk? How quickly can we get case management online? Do we know of a case management system or approach 
that is actually sufficiently different than what we do now, short of just additional capacity. Those are those are the things that I would uh, want to see. Um, convening a housing summit, I, I think there's a lot of virtue in getting a housing summit with voices from folks who live this in in, in their daily lives. Absolutely. I, I also think, however, we have a we have many of those in 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 some case ongoing and existing. What I'm most interested in is getting front end feedback from the continuum of care partners on how much of this is applicable and how much of this is doable in a practical sense. And I feel like because we have been um, understaffed in OCED and over demanded, let's say, because of you know a, things beyond a pandemic, but just the world as it is, um, we've got a community with some expertise in it, or at the very least, some some data to look at. You know what is what has worked in the past, what's come up short, and what's our best assumption as to why. Um, I, I would like to get that, you know, ASAP. And I know they are, uh, you know, looking for it. Um, in the near term, though, between now and the end of the calendar year, if we're asked by a community member, a constituent, or somebody, what is different with this proposal in hand between now and then, or now in February, that we can point to as a substantive, actionable outcome? That's uh, that, that will, that's the $24 million question for us. I, I do want to lift up a couple of things that you indicated. So number one, uh, I didn't want to step before you tonight and, and suggest that I had all of the answers around what the next action steps are. Uh, I do not. And quite frankly, I don't think that if I came and, and shared with you my plan moving forward, that it would be uh, listened to in the right way and it would move the needle for our community. I think our community is demanding that they have uh, a, a say in how we move things forward. Specifically to your comment around the continuum of care, we continue to try to engage them. Uh, the strategy from OCD, I believe, has not changed. I don't believe that you all have ever given me the grace to say that we are understaffed and I can use that as an excuse for how we deliver services, and we have never leaned on that. I want to lift up the staff in OCD because they have stepped up and filled that void. As you all know, we've lost a, a, a strong resource in the housing uh, component of OCD over the last couple of weeks to a promotional opportunity, and we have we are struggling to fill that void. The director's position has been vacant for uh, close to a year now. Uh, but that is not for lack of effort on our part. We have had, that position has been posted for nine months. We have made several attempts to expand our scope and we'll continue to do so. I just lay, I lift up all those things to say, while I don't have an immediate strategy around uh, what we should be recommending moving forward, and, and while I'm not able to say anything other than our response will be appropriate for our community as we move through the sheltering season and as we think about co-creating our future. What I believe from the seat that I sit in is that there is work to do with our current system and our current uh, response to homelessness in our community. That is not a shot on our continuum of care or any of the thought leaders in this space. I will say that what we are currently doing does not meet the change in the numbers that we're seeing in the community and our investments in this work, be it through the continuum of care, OCED, or through other areas of the county general fund seem to not be appropriate for the work that we're attempting to do. So that's probably a long-winded way of saying there, there's a lot more that we need to do before we're back in front of you all with a strategy for us to move forward. For, for, and I don't, just one last piece, sure, I'm sorry, sure. please. And, and I know that doesn't sit well with, with those that think we should just lean into the crisis immediately and uh, make some initial investments. Um, 
I just feel like that has not worked for us in the future, and I don't want to make some of those same mistakes. Um, one of my personal frustrations that I've, I've articulated poorly is um, the sense that some of these problems can actually be solved instead of um, just a, a addressed in, in, in less bad ways over time that, that, that aims towards success, but never gets there because, um, you, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's uh, just a condition of the world we live in. Um, Greg, if I'm hearing you correctly, you said this, basically the structures and folks we have at the table may not be sufficient to meet the needs. Is that a capacity issue? I think this board has made clear, and I, I know you know this, if, if it's a resource issue, you know, we want to know, but it's, it sounds like you're saying there's a missing component to that to, to actually affect outcomes in the, in the near term. W what do we think that is, or what do we need, or do we not know? I feel like it's a both and. I do think it's a resource issue, and 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 how we invest those resources uh, likely need uh, you know uh, a, a fresh analysis around. Uh, and, and then to what is taking place in our community, as you so aptly lifted up, uh, this is a human crisis across the country. It is not just something that's taking place in our community. And from what I've been able to gather through you know, the research that the team is doing and the voices in the spaces at uh, the national conferences that I've attended, there is no playbook that has worked universally in this space. And I think as we think about the thought leaders that we have in Washington County, we're further ahead of, of, than most communities that I see. And I feel like we really need to take the time to continue to evaluate and invest in this work, not ignoring the crises that we we all know uh, is in play in our community, certainly as we move into the homeless system. Uh, there, there's just a lot to unpack with all of this. Well, I, I, I appreciate the way it's framed here tonight. I, I guess I would just say um, we do have two and a half months before we're mandated to pass the budget. And I'm, I'm hopeful some of this can be worked into a budget that we pass uh, in November or December and, and, and put to use immediately and would seek to try and get you the board space and, and, and support to, to do that. So um, thank you. Thank you for the, the framework. If I may, just one last thing, because Commissioner LaVar jumped to the end, I wanted to leave you guys with, there is some recommendations around the budget that I fully expect this board to weigh in on uh, what I've heard from you all is that your principal priority is making sure that we lean into the, the housing, the homelessness, the unhoused space in a way that makes sense and it, that is aligned with our community values. And I fully expect there to be dialogue and some adjustment to the budget to lean into that space. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. All right, the queue as it stands is Commissioner Light for still in round one here. Commissioner Somerville and Commissioner Robbie in round two, but there's a couple of you that can still get in there for round one. I uh, just keep that in mind. Go ahead, Commissioner Light. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just a couple of comments as we move forward. Um, I am excited and um, yet willing to and want to continue um, to have a place um, at the table. Um, one of my concerns is that um, we are focusing on one area and not taking advantage of how large our county is uh, so that we can address um, our homelessness issue. Um, and I believe if we expand where we want to shelter um, our homeless, we can um, get some immediate um, relief and that we can make some things happen um, a bit faster uh, if we look outside of just 48197 and 48198. So my ask is that um, we begin to uh, expand where we look um, and act that way and provide, um, and we can provide the wraparound services and transportations and things that we need, um, but we need to think outside of our box because we have a large box 
um, and we can do that. And so um, I believe other townships, I have a large district, I'm in district two, it may seem a little country, but um, it's okay to live there. Um, and it's okay um, to make sure that individuals that are not housed, that they are housed. And so um, district, please don't be mad at me, but this is an invitation <laughs> to, to come to district two um, and look for um, other opportunities to house, not just short term or transitional, um, but for longevity and for housing that will accommodate all. Um, so um, that that's my ask. Thank you. I don't know that there's much to add to that other than to say that, uh, again, as I've talked about from day one, this is a, a community uh, response that we're trying to create here. And it is helpful for us to think about co-creating that community response and not have it be uh, targeted at one geographic area. It really is gonna take all of us to, to find a solution to all of that, the best solution. Anybody that hasn't, oh goodness, it's too loud. Uh, anybody that hasn't spoken yet would like to speak before I go to round two for people? If you get too close to the mic, you don't need to talk as loud, but okay. No. Nope. All right, go ahead, Commissioner Somerville. Thank you. All right. I have more I actually have some questions this time and also comments on direction that I would like us to take. Um so specifically with the existing dollars that we've already allocated, like that we allocated for this year and for next year for emergency homelessness. Um, I guess I'm wondering where that's at. And I'm wondering like if I'm a mother calling tomorrow because I've got three kids and I'm evicted, what happens um, in October of 2023 when they call Hawk? Um, and then the other question I have with respect to like barrier busters, for example, we had um, a local municipality recently allocate, allocate funding, um, a significant amount actually, but it would have been nice if that happened last October because a majority of the families that experienced evictions that ended up in our emergency hoteling program were from Ypsilanti Township. So for the dollars that they allocated from ARPA funding, how can those be used? Because I know that like some of the barrier buster dollars are restricted, but there have been, when we got money from the state of Michigan, those were unrestricted. So there were unique things that we could do. Can those barrier buster dollars be used to stop an eviction from happening more than once? Because usually you can only access barrier busters once a year. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to answer your okay. question. Sorry, yeah, it's I a think, lot of uh, questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, and, and we are joined by Moon yeah. this evening, uh, who, who supervises the Barrier Busters program, who's going to be better able to answer that. Uh, I'll let him take the, cool, uh, the Barrier Busters stuff, sure. and I can answer some okay, other Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure. Uh, to answer your question, Commissioner, yes, we can utilize some of those Ipsy Township dollars for eviction prevention. We also want to be mindful, too, that um, if we just gave it as a general use for any type of um, emergency request, all of the cases would be immediately eviction and we would be out of the money. So what we're proposing to do is have a percentage of the dollars being marketed, marked just for use for the Hawk SOS pipeline, mm -hmm. which is gonna be roughly about 35% of the total dollars. Uh, the other thing that we will be doing is that we will be um, doing disbursements on a monthly basement. So of that total, we're going to be breaking it down for a number, number of months. Um, right now, $50,000 per month. And that will give us time to see like what is the community need? How quickly are we running out of funds? And then we can do some cross data check between what we're seeing in barrier busters. Mm -hmm. And then with Department of Health and Human Services, state emergency relief. SER is the largest provider of emergency services in the county and barrier busters is the second largest. Thank you. I like your back or your blazer. Pardon me? That was a cool blazer. Um. Yeah, sorry, my blazer's not as cool. So to the budget questions, cool. uh, what, what we tried to do with the chart in the back was to represent the general fund dollars that have gone into this part of the system. Uh, the chart from two uh, two meetings ago showed all of the, the governmental funds that are flowing through the county. Um, the 
what is in there, we can get you the itemized list. I don't have that this evening, but we would have that available. Uh, it includes things such as outside agency allocations from the general fund, which would be just general operating funds that would go to support shelter association or safe house, for example, as well as other types of allocations. Um, there are two things in the administrator's recommended budget uh, that Catherine touched on last week, but not tonight because they didn't come through the budget request process, uh, but that's $400,000, a little bit more than that, uh, Catherine, in terms of structural funding, uh, that does not have a specific use at this point, but it has been earmarked for housing and homelessness. Uh, and then the big jump uh, for next year in particular is an additional $1.1 million in non-structural funding. Uh, and there is a good reason for the non-structural nature of the funding. And it has, to, I believe it's tied back to the cap uh, in terms of, no, uh, anyway, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself and Catherine, the budget's on the agenda later this evening, but it's uh, it's non-structural funding. Um, and the, the fall off after that is the having the non-structural funding budgeted any further. So that those are the funds that were talked about in, in terms of coming back to you with a recommendation to spend. Okay. Um, Can I just add one other piece? Uh, I just uh, talked, uh, asked Tina to pull up Barry and Busters and this board, allocated additional resources to barrier busters for each of the last three years. And I would expect as we move through the winter sheltering system, we will come back to this board uh, with additional resource requests if they are needed. Okay. And then, sorry if this is redundant. I'm just trying not to repeat myself, but for the, the dollars that we already allocated and for people who become homeless tomorrow, I guess I'm, and this might be an OCED question. I guess like what I, I think what I'm hoping is that like by our next meeting, we can actually take action on something that we're going to do because by November it's, it's winter. Um, and I guess I don't, I, the only way to make something happen is to formalize it by the board. So I guess like, I'm also just thinking out loud, I would like us to like, take action on making sure we prevent evictions more deeply, but also like, what are we doing right now for people who become homeless? Um, and I want us to take action on that. If it, it might be continuing the emergency hoteling. Um, I know that the master lease is gonna take some time because that's a lot more difficult, but I guess I just wanna get a better understanding of what we're gonna do, you know, around Thanksgiving and Christmas. So let me just say that in years past, we've always tried to respond appropriately, appropriately to anybody in our community that's in crisis. And what we have done repeatedly for those, you, you mentioned someone who might become homeless tomorrow, is that we've leveraged the administrator's authority to make sure that we have an immediate response. And if it goes beyond my authority, we're certainly coming back to this board to say, hey, this is what's needed. Uh, the team at OCD has been uh, huge advocates for making certain that we are investing in this work in the right way and that they come back to us with recommendations when uh, funding streams are, are, are low and our response needs to change or shift in any way. I would expect those things to continue. I would expect that we will continue to work with the continuum of care and align with the presentation that you, you all heard at working session to make sure that our response is uh, as appropriate as it can be as we move into the winter season. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Robbie, you ready? Stand ready, I know you do. <laughs> I'm always ready. Uh, all right, so I just had a couple other comments actually building off of some of the stuff that uh, Commissioner Somerville was saying. So uh, I do hope that one of the actions that we can take at our next meeting is again, to vote on a resolution to initiate the process on the Housing Commission. So saying that one more time, but I do, uh, you know, because there's a large banner behind you that says shelter now, I do think that, uh, I don't know if you may, yeah. <laughs> we can all see it, right? Uh, by the way, nice work on the banner, uh, whoever made the banner, like it's it's a rockin' banner. So, um, and, and so to Commissioner Somerville's point, you know, what, what, what I wanted to say basically is the one thing that I, I don't really see in this plan is, um, you know, a, a, an attempt to really address sort of what's been brought up today. Um, I see a lot of uh, commentary in in the PowerPoint. Again, I know this was a high level PowerPoint, but I see a lot of commentary in there um, about working to maintain 
uh, you know, sheltering that's occurring now. Uh, but I don't really see anything in there that speaks to, you know, what the community's calling for, which is an expansion of immediate sheltering, you know. And so, right, what I see in the proposal that you have here, it says maintain support for shelters and service providers. Great. But I think what, what, what we're being asked for is to expand on what we're already doing, not just to maintain uh, what's being done. I think maintaining is like sort of the minimum and, uh, and how do we build from there? Uh, and I don't really see that incorporated in the plan. So what I would hope for is, and, and you know, there were some specific proposals that were brought forward by the public around um, you know, looking at specific facilities and you know it's I, I think at least worth exploring and looking at as a county and you know if it's not that property maybe there's another property if it's not an Ipsy maybe there's another community um, but you know as was said there's issues all around the county right it's not just in Ann Arbor it's not just an Ipsy there's you know we have a big county and so maybe there are um, opportunities for the county to invest in a facility that can help with the immediate sheltering needs of our, you know, uh, other Washtenaw County residents. And I just, I would at least like to see in, you know, something concrete on that to look into it, to explore it. Um, and I don't see that in the presentation, but yeah, go ahead. I expect that you will see that in the next, in the, at the next meeting in two weeks. Uh, that also gives us an opportunity to engage uh, with the stakeholders that were in the space tonight. And specific yeah. to the city of Ypsilanti, uh, it's my hope to convene a conversation uh, prior to the recommendation that, that we bring to you guys uh, at the next meeting and at future meetings. What I've heard repeatedly is that we don't want you to recommend something that you haven't had at least a, a dialogue with us uh, around. So we want to make sure that we have the opportunity to do that. And we will do that with deliberate haste and try to make sure that we engage prior to the next meeting. And I think when we have a housing summit, I, I would encourage us to frame it as less of a discussion of nonprofit executives and civic leaders and more of a discussion that centers the voice of the actual community that's impacted. Uh, and that's, you know, that the folks that spoke tonight, I think, I think we need to have them centered in that conversation. So, um, you know, and so, just one other quick thing I wanted to mention because it came up in public comment and I noticed it in the working session presentation, but the fact that the they, um, I believe they had a list of all the uh, churches that are providing shelter that are signed up and the list in, um, in Ann Arbor seemed somewhat complete, but there was some dates missing. Uh, but I think somebody said that, you know, the list in other parts of the county is pretty incomplete still, and we're approaching, you know, colder weather. And so um, I don't know if that takes some kind of an investment on our part. It probably does. Um, and, you know, I know that we have a lot of connections and partnerships with different organizations across the county that go even beyond the churches. So, I mean, at a bare minimum, I think that should be explored within the proposal that you're developing for two weeks from now. So uh, that's all I had to say, thank you. Thank you, note it. And we will reach out to, uh, to the community in Ypsilanti uh, prior to the next meeting and prior to the recommendation coming back to you all. Anything else from anybody? No. We're all good. All right, team, thank you for the presentation. We'll look forward to seeing the next, what comes next. Oh, look at that, applause, very nice. Yeah, I'll join you in applause. Okay, that's the, the slow clap that led to nothing. All right, so a couple of things here uh, as we move into the agenda now, there's closed session coming up. Uh, Evan, I told you I'd get you out of here as quickly as I could. I was hoping it would be before 10.42. Uh, I assume you'd still like to get out as quickly as you can. Okay, so here's how I wanna, Commissioner Labar, uh, ears up please, because I'm probably gonna look to you to do this. What I'd like to have you do, or someone, anybody that's you know so moved, uh, is to move the final reading and single reading items up until going into closed session and then also claims, so we can just knock those ones out. 
then we'll do the other stuff when I come back or when we come back. Also, when I come back. Chair, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, do, do we need to do any of the other stuff before liaison reports or special order business or anything like that, or can I hop right in? You can hop right into it. Um, I would move then the agenda starting with uh, resolutions. The first reading, the resolution from the AG on the sexual assault kit. No, no, actually, I wanted you to start with the set. I just want to do final, single, oh, and forget. claims. Yes, yes. But, but you can do the other thing, but that's not what I was hoping for. But you want final, single, closed session. Final, single, claims, not closed session. Gotcha. Okay. I would move number two, A, the resolution establishing a new discretionary fee for passport photos. B, a resolution approving acceptance of area agency 1B and claims. And do the single ones And then too. single A, a resolution ratifying uh, water resource commissioner on the grant. And then B, the resolution of support for house bills 430-82 and 430-83. Resolution supporting the drive safe bills in the Michigan House and Senate. D, a resolution in support of HR 15, the Equity, the Equality Act. E, uh, previously handled Bishop Roger uh, Johnson Sr. resolution. And then F, which would be the motion to go into closed session to discuss. No, 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 that, no, I don't want F. The, the, all the other stuff is good. Okay. Up until that point. Is there a second? Thank you. This will be, it'll make so much sense later. It, it's just cleaner this way. I uh, didn't like to put anybody, any of them for separate consideration. Nope, we're gonna jump into discussion. Okay, Evan, now's your opportunity, please. Come to the podium and give us what you got. I know you got two really good items here. We've been waiting for them. You've been waiting. Yeah, I, I apologize. I forgot which item is first. Which do you wanna hear about first? Yeah, do the, do the damn item, please. <laughs> um, damn. Oh, right. Yes. Um, so we've received uh, grant funding from the state to continue uh, design work on a couple of dams we've got on the east side of the counties. Uh, one of those dams actually does have a, an effect on the neighborhoods upstream that flooded recently in a flooding event. Um, so we'd like to just continue. And, you know, this obviously allows us to set up the grant funding, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can continue the work. We certainly are nowhere near enough money to actually do the physical improvements out there, but we want to get the design done and more importantly, get the permits because permitting is a really lengthy process. I learned through this that removing a dam really doesn't have much to do with getting rid of a bunch of concrete. It has everything to do with restoring the stream that used to be there. And that's more expensive than actually getting rid of the actual dam itself. So this allows us to plug away with that and work on the permit. Anybody have any damn questions? Mr. Robbie, you want the other one. Any damn questions? None. Okay, please uh, talk to us about the drain code. Yeah, so um, this uh, there is uh, legislation that was introduced uh, earlier this year as well as last session for a particular part of the somewhat confusing uh, statute that governs county drain commissioners. It's really just a special assessment law. And this is an item Janice Bobrin worked on in the 1990s and unfortunately was unsuccessful. What it would do is provide another tool in the toolkit. It's enabling legislation, not mandating legislation. It would enable communities that want to work together on large scale water issues to uh, form a district and work together. The key difference between the rest of the drain code is most of the drain code really requires you to focus on continuous linear infrastructure, whereas this particular legislation would allow people to work on whatever the group wants to. If they wanted to work on water quality or if they said we need a regional storage basin to deal with problems, but we don't need a county drain, uh, it allows a lot more flexibility. So. Uh, resolution of support has already been passed by Wayne County uh, for this and just looking to, you know, up our odds of maybe not before the end of this legislative session, but to hit the new year with the ground running. So Excellent. Would be, we would appreciate the board's support on, on that item. Commissioner Robbie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a quick question on this. Um, I know, so obviously we have the Watershed Council. How does something like this interplay with the Watershed Council? Does it I mean, I know obviously it's yep. a special assessment uh, and it could potentially include the entire watershed, right? So it could yeah. be like the Huron River Watershed Council, except with special assessment authority. Yeah. 
but can you talk more about the interplay between the two? Yeah, the, the short version is, I think Janice would echo this, the way I see it and, and other folks who are maybe even more likely than Washtenaw County to actually use this statute is it would really supplement the ability of watershed councils to implement the things that they do. There's a limited amount of funding for water stuff, you know, as far as grants go. A lot of watershed councils rely heavily on grants uh, or community foundations, even here locally. Uh, you know, that's the biggest source of funding. Membership dues are less than 10%. And, you know, grants and this, that, and the other is quite a spreadsheet that they've got. There's always this rolling, revolving door. But the implementation piece of all the wonderful watershed planning that not just the Huron River Watershed Council, but watershed councils all around the state uh, do would be uh, assisted by this part of the drain code. And, and I guess at, at risk of uh, extending your meeting further, watershed councils actually got formed, the enabling legislation for watershed councils in the late 60s, actually out of use of the particular section of the drain code that we'd like to revisit to study the whole Huron River and pollution issues in the 60s that ultimately resulted in hey, let's have a combined YCUA sewer plant. Uh, no, let's not run sewage from Ann Arbor. So it, it's interesting that there's a little bit of a loop between watershed councils and this part of the drain code. But this section of the drain code, again, in its old version, actually is what led to formation of watershed councils because everybody who had worked together to do a study to figure out what problems needed to be solved, uh, those had to be solved through public works. And so the Department of Public Works here at the county was very active in the 70s and 80s, addressing many, many of the problems and issues uh, with sewage, you know, that was causing some of the problem. But ultimately, those folks who had convened to talk about what are our problems and, and what's the best way to solve them, they wanted to keep working together on water quality issues for the Huron River. And, you know, like many, many other environmental things that are now state law, it started in Washtenaw County and, uh, you know, the delegation from here actually put that through. So it's kind of a, you know, full closed loop. I'm not sure, you know, full transparency. I'm not sure every watershed council in the state is seeing it that way yet. But um, I, you know, I would, I would have a good discussion with anybody who said we don't need any more funding for watershed councils. I think this would be a great tool for them uh, and they would be able to have, uh, you know, participate, have a seat at the table. I think the last thing I'll say is this legislation also would um, have the drain commissioner in a less central and sole decision-making role. It would really allow the partners who come together to all be one community, one vote, and the commissioner would be one vote in that group. And so hopefully that's beneficial to communities that sometimes are uncomfortable working with different drain or water resource commissioners across the state. Um, just last comment is uh, obviously you know, you mentioned Janice, and I just want to like elevate her and the work that she's done so many years for our community and elevate you, Evan, for being such a great leader for our environment and protector of our water in Washtenaw County for so many years. So public service is not an easy calling, but want to thank you and Janice before you for all that you've done for our community. Yep. She's, she's still well respected throughout the state. All right. Any drain questions, friends? No. All right. What are you, what are you pointing? You got something for me? No. You, later. Chair, my apologies. Uh, so um, the Water Resources Commissioner also included a memo, which was listed in communications yeah. uh, regarding stormwater. And he was asking if this would be the time uh, for him to speak on that memo to the board. Sure, speak on the memo. And friends, if you're in board portal, you can click on communications and find his memo. Yep. You're in Sounds good. I just heard that there might be a question or two, but I'll keep it short. I'm trying to get you out of here. So. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm trying to get you out of here too. It's mutually beneficial, right? Well, we'll be here for another hour <laughs> and a half or so. I expect. Yeah. Sorry. I just don't want to turn that into two hours. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Give us the memo. So um, there's a memorandum in there. The short version is, uh, if you haven't had a chance to dive in there, it's kind of a one pager that summarizes a comparison of the storm events we had in August of 2023 to what happened in 2021. Those two are both kind of records uh, for the area. Um, some of the board was here when we had a little debrief on the 2021 events. Uh, and, you know, these are the largest storms that have ever happened, you know, in the county as far as the amount of rain that fell. Um, the point is, 
it took a couple of weeks. It takes a little longer for the calls to filter in, particularly since um, there was no emergency and FEMA wasn't involved and it was less clear to people who they should call. It was more difficult for the agencies to coordinate. But the bottom line is the 2023 event, although it was about an inch less rain, it fell in a much, much shorter period and it created more impacts for people than anyone realized at the beginning. Um, I would go back to the communication I shared with the board a day or two after the storm saying, here's what we know now. I put a line in there and said, it's been my experience in these emergencies that we learn more later. And it usually isn't turning out that things were better than we thought. So true enough, about 70% more basements had poop in them, uh, basement flooding in, in the east side of the county, uh, none in Ann Arbor. So there, there were very few impacts or calls from the city of Ann Arbor, a few, they were sprinkled around town. Uh, and also about 40% uh, more calls came to our office for surface and street flooding. I did meet with YCUA and the road commission today to just talk about what are we all doing. And it was really my first opportunity to learn the extent of roads that were completely underwater, um, particularly in the south part of the West Willow neighborhood, multiple streets, but there were also areas um, north of the freeway, north of Tyler Road, kind of in that Parkwood, Hawthorne, Glenwood uh, area uh, of the township that were completely underwater. And when I say completely underwater, I mean doorstep to doorstep. You can't see the sidewalk. There's some photos in here. So it was there was a lot more roads blocked. And in turn, that meant there were a lot more vehicles that were totaled uh, as a result of being flooded out or otherwise needed major repairs. So the property damage, we don't have any ability to compare property damage from this storm to the previous one. Um, and I'm still trying to track down. It's somewhat difficult as you can imagine to go through the resources at the federal government to learn. So how much FEMA money actually went to pay to help people from 2021, just so we could have a better understanding of what does it mean to make an emergency declaration? What's the benefit, uh, this, that, and the other. I think the only comment I'd have on that is if anybody's grandma here, had had a flooded basement, I think you would have agreed with her, that's an emergency. And it's an emergency you have to deal with immediately. It's an emergency that absorbs your life for at least a week or two while you're getting your basement dried out. And it's an emergency that absorbs a good six or eight months of your life while you're trying to get people in to repair the stuff when there's so many other things. You know, a, a good yardstick, uh, when one of these big storm happens, again, everybody can't go take a look at what's going on, but driving around the neighborhood about two days after a big storm and just looking at what's up on the curb is, is a pretty old rule of thumb that people use. If you, if you catch it before the trash company comes, just to see the amount of stuff that comes out of people's basements. So it's life-changing, life-affecting for the people that work there. Um, as far as action steps from our office, uh, you know, at least two large areas, large neighborhoods, you know, the West Willow area, in this area I'm talking about um, uh, around Parkwood and uh, Tyler and so forth, uh, north of the freeway, south of the railroad tracks and uh, you know, east of the city. Uh, basically the township is going to uh, authorize us to come in and do study work and get a better understanding. This is very old infrastructure. Uh, a lot of it dates back to the 1920s. Uh, none of it was sized to handle no infrastructure is sized to handle the storms that we saw in 2021 or 2023, but we would like to identify strategies to reduce the frequency and severity of flooding in those areas. And I think YCUA has indicated they'd like to work on those things. But Ipsy Township has been proactive. Uh, they're certainly going to fund us doing all the study work, public engagement uh, that's necessary, and we'll certainly include uh, commissioners in any of the follow up. I know uh, residents have been attending Yucca Board meetings and township board meetings uh, to express their experiences. But again, it was worse than we thought. It was worse than 2021 as far as impacts to people. And uh, I, you know, there's some more detailed information in the back of the memorandum. I tried to keep it to one sheet for the highlights, but then a little more detail. The bottom line is the rain data that's out there that tells us, oh, this is how likely one a big storm is to occur. It's all out of date and it's, it's difficult to know, but obviously seeing storms that are have Theoretically, according to you know the analysis that they've done for two storms in you know three years to be less likely than a half a percent to happen to both happen, you know, suggests that just the data and the information is out of date. So we're gonna see this more and more. Same thing I said in 2021 for people who weren't here. 
uh, you're going to see it more and more. I, you know, honestly, our office can't keep up uh, with all of that. We don't know exactly what keeping up looks like, but we do try to work with communities to reduce the frequency and severity of flooding to the best of our ability. Uh, I just think that what we're doing right now is keeping us from getting further behind faster. Uh, we're trying to slow down how fast we get behind is, is right now probably about all we could honestly do for people. So that's the summary. I don't know if there's any questions. Good summary. Any questions? Seeing none. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time. Oh, we're always happy to have you. All right. Now I would, you're going to vote on it now. So Bryce, it's a roll call vote. Commissioner Hodge. Yep. Commissioner Labar. Yes. Commissioner Light. Yes. Commissioner Machieski. Yes. Commissioner Robbie. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Yay. Many resolutions passed. All right. Now it's closed session time. All right. I would uh, make a motion, Chair, to go into closed session to discuss an opinion from legal counsel and discuss collective bargaining strategy. Is there a second? All right, roll call vote us, Rice. Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Light? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Robbie? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Somerville? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. All right, so for our audience or people joining us at home, this is where we leave. Uh, we'll be back at an undetermined time. We still have much more on our agenda, so stay tuned. That was a good time to use the bathroom, get a break. Eat some snacks, but we will be back at some point. See you later. Right, right. Sure, sure.
All right, oh, I'm gonna have to do that again. Okay, tell me when the audio's back. You ready? I'm gonna hit it again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move the, you know, just so it picks up. All right, calling us back in order at 1212. Good morning, happy Thursday, my friends. Who better to spend the long night into the early morning with than this fine group of people? Commissioner Scott, I hope you're still watching. I expect that you watch. And, all right, let's get back to it. I right, look for someone to move the resolution to retain one or more law firms to represent the county in a class action lawsuit. Anybody like that one? You feel good about that one? I'm, I'm, Tell me about it. I what? Hold on. Time out. Brady, distribute it. Brady, distribute it, please. Brady, where's Brady? Brady. Ringing in my ear. Sorry. For our friends online, there's a. Yeah, I'm going to have watch recording and see if this picks up. Okay. Come on, stay awake. We do have quite a bit of. Uh, uh, my. Can I, no, I don't want to hit the. Is this mahogany? I don't think this is mahogany. I'm going to break out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're the one that said use the gavel more. You explicitly <laughs> said to use the gavel more. And I like it. Feels good. What? It's going to take a few minutes. Okay, so then let's do some of the other stuff. Yep, we're, we're going to have to wait a few minutes. So now we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We got liaison reports. We got, we got a liaison report anybody like to share? Commissioner Machieski, tell Thank us you something. Chair. What you got? This morning, the Board of Public Works met um, for their monthly meeting and uh, it was reported that the new home top toxic center uh, is now open Tuesday through Thursday for, for scheduled appointments online. They can handle 20 a day. Uh, and so they're very excited about that. So open to the public now. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, that the, you may remember Theo Egamont uh, presented last month or like earlier this month in October at our first meeting, uh, about the uh, materials management process that the county will have to go through. Uh, he did mention at that time that, that they were waiting on a letter from the state to trigger the process, and they still don't have the letter. So once they do, then the process will be triggered, uh, and we will we receive that letter as a board of commissioners. So just to let you know, that letter hasn't arrived yet. All right. Mm, toxins. Mm. Anybody else got liaison? You got one? Commissioner Robbie, liaison us. I, I just need to have a quick, quick question. Yeah. Uh, to Commissioner Machieski, uh, the did, did you get a status update on the home toxics drop off at Zeb? I, I think it was closed for a while or something. It is reopened. Actually, it was reopened. Uh, they're so they're not doing the weekday <clears throat> at the office anymore, but they're doing this still the special Saturday events. And, and this past Saturday was one of those events. Okay, it was so well publicized that the line was all the way back down to ninety four. Oh my God! Uh, this past Saturday, so they're working on some some ways to address that traffic flow issue. But that the, the periodic Saturday events are now open again. Uh, do you know if they're going to open the weekday ones, or are they going to? Uh, they're sending people out to the new home toxic site to handle that all that material out there. Is my understanding? Yes. Good. Other liaison reports from anybody? I don't know what Commissioner Sanders is laughing about over there. She might got a liaison report. You got you got you got one to share? No. Okay, mine your own. Anybody got another one? Good, good. Okay, thank you. I share that I had Brownfield earlier this week. It was a good time. There's some Brownfield stuff on here. Uh, Nathan is. I don't see Nathan in the audience anywhere. You can put the camera back on me at this point. Thank you. Uh, yep, no Nathan, but Nathan will be here at our next meeting to give you all the Brownfield you're looking for, Commissioner Robbie. I know you you like the Brownfield a lot. Uh, I just hope you don't have too many brownfield questions today as we move into special orders of business because I'd look for somebody to move the special orders of business one by one. How about that? Okay, well, thank you. It's, you know, keep your word, please. I would look for somebody to move the first special. Yep. Uh, I'd move the first uh, special order of business setting a uh, public hearing on receiving comment on the quadrennial budget for November 1st at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Any discussion on it? 
Nope, tune in for a special order of business on that date, Bryce. Roll call us. Commissioner Light? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Robbie? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Somerville? <clears throat> yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Labar? Yes. Thank you. Love it. All right. One more time. Chair, I'd move the uh, resolution of the public hearing to receive comment on the Brownfield Plan Amendment uh, for November 1st at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Any discussion? Commissioner Robbie is writing his questions down right now for our next meeting. Go ahead, Bryce. Roll call it. Commissioner Machieski. Yes. Commissioner Robbie. Yes. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Commissioner Hodge. Yep. Commissioner Labar. Yes. Commissioner Light. Yes. Boom. Tune in on November 1st for that one. All right, we'll look for somebody to move the appointments. This is normally what I'd ask if anybody that's going to be likely to receive one of these appointments would like to speak, but they're, uh, if you're here with us, you get a gold star. Uh, is anybody that's, you, you get an appointment? Yeah, no. Well, then, no, then I can't let you do it. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, somebody want to move the appointments? So I'll move the appointments in uh, item seven, one through three. Good. Any, is there a second? Any discussion? Bryce, look how efficient this is, so fast. Commissioner Robbie. Yes. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Commissioner Hodge. Yes. Commissioner Labar. Yes. Commissioner Light. Yes. Commissioner Machieski. Yes. The appointments passed, boom. All right, uh, great. Well, congratulations to everyone appointed. Thank you for your service to Washtenaw County. Cons consent agenda time. I'll just tell you nothing spicy in communications this time. Uh, stay tuned for next time. I'm waiting, Ottawa County. I'm waiting. Uh, Looking look for somebody to move the consent agenda. Is there a second? All right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? The voice vote. Aye. Uh, boom. Consent agenda. All right. Now we are back to resolutions. I need somebody to move the first reading resolutions. Oh, Commissioner Labar is just on fire today. Just yeah. national all these. We all have skills, yes. Uh, I'd move uh, under first reading 1A, the AG Sexual Assault Kit Prevention Grant, MOU. Under B, the resolution to approve the FY24 Enhancement Grant for the East Washtenaw Community and Recreation Center. Uh, C, a resolution approving final recommendation for the RFP on the Human Services 2023 High Impact Grants. D, a resolution to establish criteria for uh, veterans enhanced assistance with burial, with uh, payment for burial expenses. I do want to attest publicly that I specifically gave recommendations to the two staff members here for that item that they should leave prior to uh, our uh, closed session. So if they're not here, that's on me. Thank you, Chair. I use a second. Any pull them? You might want to pull any of them for separate consideration. That I'm not feeling, not doing that. Okay. Uh, any discussion on any of them? What you got for us, Commissioner Robbie? Thank you. I just had a quick question on the veterans burial expenditures. Where is the where is this coming out of budget wise? I didn't. Where's it coming out of budget wise? Let's hear it. Deputy Administrator. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, this would be funded by the veterans millage proceeds. Uh, there are sufficient millage proceeds right now. Uh, there's actually uh, figures on that inside the revenue white paper, um, but this is not expected to meaningfully uh, you know, cause any budget issues uh, with, with the revenues coming into that fund. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody? Questions? Nope. Nope, not seeing any of this. Bryce, voice vote time, all in favor. Uh, nope, what you got? Uh, yeah, I know. Actually, never mind. I'm sorry. I'm good. No, no, no don't, don't apologize. What do you get? I don't want you to be stifled. It, it's okay. Trust I, I trust that the staff have done an adequate job of on item B of removing references to the Y, but I see that in the agenda that was at least in front of us on the Get in board portal. It's updated in board portal. I understand that. And that's why I removed my thoughts initially, uh, right. but I just saw it still on the paper version. So I just wanted to make sure. I can bust it open for you right here. It's okay. I trust you. Okay. You trust the staff. I trust the staff too. All in favor. All right. Boom. Good. 
All right, now we are down to that. So good. And we can handle all those other ones later. Uh, now I'm looking. We're at that other one, single reading. Yeah, you, you, yep. Single reading, the resolution about this resolution authorizing the chair of the board of commissioners to sign a retainer agreement with long resolution title. Somebody want to move that one? Commissioner Robbie. Thank you. Is there a second? Any further discussion on it? Where's all the enthusiasm to talk about it? I don't know what happened. It's not like it's Thursday or anything. Bryce, roll call vote. Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Somerville. Yes. Commissioner Beeman. Yes. Commissioner Hodge. Yes. Commissioner Labar. Yes. Commissioner Light. Yes. Commissioner Machieski. Yes. Commissioner Robbie. Yes. Thank you. I look forward to signing it. Okay, report from the county administrator. Do you want to hit these other two today? Yeah, these are these are quick quick items that I, I hope I want. The item two, the revenue white paper, uh, that certainly meant at this point to be filed. Uh, certainly, we know that it will get some other uh, conversations and some other items for discussion at a later date. It was certainly not meant to inform or shift this body thinking around things that. So, uh, if nothing else, I'll move to item three and ask Andrew to give you a brief, very brief update on an item that you've already given us all. Uh, very brief. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. The, the memo that the county administrator is referencing uh, has to do with the use of $4 million worth of ARPA funds that were allocated through the third round of ARPA funding for government services. Uh, Catherine spoke about these last week in her uh, discussion about the budget request process as these were uh, received and vetted through that process. Uh, the reason they are not included for separate consideration on the board is that the ARPA 3.0 memo uh, authorized the execution and contracts of these. Uh, this is a similar process as to what was done last year with the $4 million allocated for county infrastructure spending. Uh, so you'll find both the summary and then the details of the specific projects. Um, a lot of building stuff in there, a lot of building stuff that looks at sustainability, as well as that uh, long-term need for the uh, garage at the Water Resources Commissioner shop. Any questions? Any questions, friends? No questions, okay. Well, thank you, team. Thank you for the report. I understand that the, you got something else? No, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you for the report. I know that the, the white paper, a lot of time and effort went to that. I know it's gonna generate a lot of discussion. I would just say, I appreciate the future focused nature of the work and what we're gonna have to think about. A lot of hard work ahead. Great. Yeah. Uh, you just, well, the next item is my item. You got something from Get in there. I'm just, you know, just so, yeah. Well, I'm not going to forget you. I would never do that. All right. All right. Uh, report from the chair board of commissioners. You know, I'm going to keep it brief. I've got like 10 things to go through real quick here. Uh, not going to do that, actually. The only one I'm going to give you is you got to make sure you do the cybersecurity training. It's due by October 23rd. You got a few days left for it. I knocked it out the other day. Just knock out the cybersecurity training. Many of you are on board portal now, uh, but do you, you can't access the cybersecurity training? Okay. Well, we will get support for everyone to meet the deadline for the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is all of our responsibility. All right. That's I'm giving you one of the test questions right now. It's every it's yours too. It's yours. It's all of ours. It's a shared responsibility. It's not just Tyler's. It's all of our responsibility. Please do the cybersecurity training by October 23rd. Thus concludes my report. Items for current and future discussion, recommended quadrennial budget. Commissioner Robbie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess like since it's 1230 a.m., um, I, I find myself once again in the position where uh, I feel pressure to not actually ask the questions that I have, but I implore the board to consider allocating more time for us to have discussions about this because our working session it's not the fault of the chair, was completely insufficient for us to actually delve into this issue. And I think it requires us to probably meet on a separate day um, and go into full depth on this issue. Briefly, some of the things that I would like to highlight that I would love to discuss at a future working session, I wanna fully understand why we got the recommendations that we did. Some of the items on here it do, do not match up to the ranking system that was created. For example, 
a labor relations attorney was, if you look at the ranking, was in the fourth uh, quadrant, quartile, uh, and ranked, I believe it was 56th out of 59, uh, 57th out of 59, and yet was still recommended for funding. I don't understand why that happened uh, in the context of this, especially given that a lot of other programs in the first quartile um, were not necessarily funded. It does create a staff position, which so does something like the Washington ID program, and yet that one's in the pending category and we're funding the other position. So I just have, I really think we need to take the time to delve into this. I wanna understand what this court, district court revenue reduction item is. Why is that on there? What does that mean? We need to take the time to really delve into this. And obviously we can't do that at 12.30 a.m. Um, as a side note, I will also say, uh, I still hope that we can have a follow-up discussion with the sheriff's office and uh, the mental health uh, department about the millage. We still weren't able to ask the questions Again, we were shorted on time at our last working session, two working sessions ago. We need the opportunity to delve into this. And, and I just, I think we, we have to schedule other time to be able to do that. So in the interest of the late hour, I'll stop there, but. I would never want you to feel shorted on time. I think our team is ready to answer any questions you might have. I feel like I've got my second or third win here. I'm ready to go to two. If you wanna get into the quadrennial budget questions now, if not, Happy to make sure that we get all those questions answered at our next meeting, either working session. I want to be respectful to my colleagues. And I already told Catherine that she should go home because she was waiting. And so she's not here to answer. We'll make sure we get it done on the first. Thank you. Any, what, Commissioner Sanders? No, she didn't raise her hand up or anything. I was just going to point out for working session that we'll make sure that there's. I'm just curious. So the, the um, what are we calling them? The office hours. Is that not a time to be able to get clarity on? It's a time to get clarity on the time, but to the point that Commissioner Robbie made earlier, he wants to make those questions and make any of those points in this venue as well. Correct, that's correct. It is a time that we all have available to do that. Got anything else? No, okay. Any pending items? There are none. So we look for a motion to adjourn. So this will be the last, the final time I'm gonna strike the, all right, all in favor, aye. All right, great.